<clears throat> so, very wonderful to be here, and we have quite a larger amount of time available to us, so that's very good. We can have an easier pacing and make sure that whatever we're looking at is, is heard and then absorbed, and you find a way to make use of it in your own understanding. So the, the general topic is about Mahamudra. Uh, there are many explanations of the, the meaning of Mahamudra. Maha generally means big or great. Uh, this is uh, usually identified with emptiness. Mudra is uh, general meaning is something which is sealed, something which is defined. And Siya Lama always explained it as when the king writes a document, the seal is applied and then nobody should change the document. It's like the final word. So the idea of Mahamudra is everything is sealed inside emptiness. So in that sense, Mahamudra and Sokshen are about the same because Sokshen is the great completion. The great completion means nothing more to be done. Mahamudra is the same idea. So in our lives, generally we are busy. We are going from this place to some other place, getting something done because we don't feel quite satisfied with this condition, or we see that there is potential for more to be developed. This is the life of the ego. The ego would like to be complete. The ego <clears throat> tries to be complete. The ego, our ego self, pretends, I know who I am, this is me, but it has a structural incompletion within it. There's always a lack in our ego self. We're always missing something. So the ego is an incomplete state which pretends to be complete or yearns to be complete, but it can't be complete because it wants to be complete in itself. The ego is already complete within the great completion because it's already included. The whole uh, direction of the understanding of emptiness is that there is no limit, there is no boundary, there is nothing outside of this, this is it. And so everything which arises in this, which is always our here and now presence, is already within the whole. The whole never fragments, it doesn't collapse, it doesn't break up, everything is within it. So all diversity, all the many, many forms of experience we have, the state of our body, our health, the thoughts, the emotions, sensations we have, all of this, each moment of it is just what it is. And what is it? It's the radiance of the completion. It's the radiance of the ground. So this is the heart of Mahamudra, that we find ourselves not in touch with the great completion. We find ourselves alienated from ourselves, not because some demon has cursed us, not because some bad person has done this to us, not even because we are bad people, but just because. Just because. It's like that. We are in samsara, and this is where we are. This is what we have to start from. I'm here. <laughs> I know a few things about where I am. I'm in Germany. I'm in a nice place, in a tent. That is to say, I explain to myself where I am. I use concepts to give structure and shape to my experience. In this way, I help myself to understand where I am, and I use this understanding to make sure that I will never ever be fully present where I am. <laughs> and this is the double move. This is the horror of samsara. The very thing that we use to try to help ourselves creates the obscuration. So this is why we say if the Buddha hadn't come into the world, we'd all be completely lost because we can't see it. 
we try our best, parents try their best to educate their children, societies offer all kinds of analysis of agriculture, economic systems, how to behave with elders of the community and so on. There's so many kinds of advice and instruction we receive. But all of these are structured in terms of duality. This is how you need to behave. This is what has to be done. So organize yourself, see the nature of the task, mobilize your energy to the completion of the task, and then you'll be all right for a while. And then, of course, impermanence will unravel everything and you have to try again and again. And that's our life. We know what that's like. Always something more to do. It never ends. There is no beginning or end to samsara. It won't end by itself because it's a self-perpetuating system. It perpetuates itself by the sense, I have to do this. We see the birds flying around. This morning, I was looking in the sky and there were beautiful swallows and swifts flying around and they looked so graceful. But these are killers. Poor little insects hovering in the air. So, <laughs> so beautiful killers. This is the world. Good for me, bad luck for you. I find you tasty. <laughs> in the food chain. And we're all engaged in the food chain one way or another. We are of necessity devouring creatures. We are predatory. Even if you want to be purely vegan, the production methods will always involve the deaths of insects and bacteria and all kinds of uh, things which are growing and alive. They may not have mind, but they certainly have life. So, <clears throat> the task in Mahamudra, <clears throat> as in Dzogchen, is to allow ourselves to relax out of the compulsion to do something, to release ourselves from the burden of activity in which we are the doer of the deed, and to see that when you are really relaxed, life goes on. You are irrelevant. Your ego self, your hopes, your fears, your desires are irrelevant. Mostly we find this when we die. Life goes on. How is it possible? Because you're gone. People meet together to celebrate that you're gone and they eat and they drink and they have a good time. <laughs> you're not there, you're in a box, maybe in the ground or going into the burner, but life goes on. So this is what we can notice now. We can let the ego relax. Don't be so burdened. Life is going on because the ground, the fundamental ground of experience is not your ego self. It is the integrity, the undivided <clears throat> a base, which is awareness and emptiness, or primordial purity. And from this primordial purity, you have this spontaneous emergence of all the differentiated experiences that we encounter. So that's just the general overview of what we are uh, about. And we have time to practice. There are two main uh, styles or approaches to uh, Mahamudra. One is called Essence Mahamudra, mm -hmm. which means the immediate presence in immediacy. That is to say, it's not mediated through anything. It's not a process that you have to transform this into that, but it's just this. That can be difficult if you try. So for people who like to try, there are four stages of Mahamudra. <laughs> there is one-pointedness and then simplicity or non-complication and then one taste, 
and then uh, non-meditation. These are ways of slowing down, of releasing, doing it as it were, step by step. So generally in the, in the Dharma traditions, we have the Lamrim, the stages of the Pa, a progressive series of doing things, which can be progressions of going towards enlightenment in the Mahayana approach. Or here in Mahamudra, these can be progressively ways of releasing yourself from bondage in delusion, from letting go, or we can just let go. What stops us just letting go is our attachment and our belief that our activity is necessary. We hope, or certainly someone like me hopes, that even at this very moment, having tidied up from breakfast, the people in the kitchen will be busy starting to prepare lunch. <laughs> we wish them to work hard for our benefit. So when we say non-activity, it doesn't mean that actions for the preservation of life would not continue. Children need to be protected and fed and told stories and put to bed and so on. There are many connective activities that go on. When it's saying no activity, it means the constructive activity of joining things together in patterns which are self-centered so that the ego becomes the hub of the wheel, the spokes go out, we articulate into many different activities, and then the wheel keeps turning. We do that by judging ourselves, judging other people, running our ceaseless commentaries about our experience, whether it's good or bad, or what we expected or not what we expected. There's always something to say. So there's an event, and just on the moment that it's vanishing, oh, one more thing, one more thing. Our mind is leaping in and joining together and so constructing these patterns which take on a kind of gravity or density which becomes uh, a way of starting to build things. Generally this is called uh, duche in Tibetan or samskara. And do means to gather, che means to do. It's a composition. The composition of the idea of the event. Life is always happening. It's just happening. What is happening is an account of the happening. The happening is a verb. It's a dynamic, it's a connective movement, and it's vanishing. For example, if somebody plays three notes on a piano, each note, ding dong dang, arises and vanishes. Sound gone into silence. What was that? Oh, that reminds me of, in somebody's off saying, yes, Brahms uses that as the beginning of one of his pieces. It's an associative thing. That's what we call being learned having many, many patterns in our mind which start to resonate as they are evoked by a pattern which is arising now. But no pattern arose, just this. So this, the immediate freshness, plus the patterning of the conceptual interpretation creates a formation which then goes into vibration with this repertoire or this memory bank of patterns you've already experienced or even heard about. Oh, so that's what it's about. And these two come together. The second order cooking of the fresh moment and the previously developed idea. That double idea is our life. Solid, restricted, limited, and prone to anxious vibration. So that is what we mean by avoiding activity or releasing activity. It's not that the flow of life should be stopped. You couldn't do that. If you stop breathing, you're going to die. 
So we breathe and we drink and we piss and we're part of this movement out into the world, the world coming into us. We're, we are part of the world. Can we trust the simplicity of this? So, uh, the first of these four stages in Mahamudra is called one-pointedness, which we're familiar with because it's just another way really of saying a shamatha or calm city, in which we take a focus for our attention and use that focus as a gentle support for ignoring what else is going on. It's a way of protecting ourselves against distraction. Usually, we are very, very distracted, but have no idea that we're distracted. It's only when you sit and you want to focus your attention, for example, on the sensation of the breath at the nostrils, that you realize how difficult that is to do, because your mind goes off. It's not the, uh, the instruction about focusing your attention on the breath that causes the distraction. It reveals the distraction that is always going on. That is to say, we are extremely relational as people. Even if you live in a cave, you are relating to all kinds of things, changes in temperature, whether there's enough food left, whether it's starting to snow, whether some wild animal's going to come into the cave, whether you feel sad and lonely, outside and inside, there are triggering events and we are moving and pulsing in reaction to them. That's how we function in the world with other people. It is not fundamentally wrong, the basic connectivity or relatedness. This is <coughs> in another uh, way of speaking, what we could describe as compassion or kindness, that we are available for contact. The key difference is whether you are available for contact in its first element, which is receptivity, something arrives for you, and then the second thing would be the response. So the door, the front door should be open that we receive. Whether we need to react to what we've received, that's another matter. Because we've got this kind of hair trigger, this very developed way of instant reaction, we tend to respond when we don't need to respond. We worry, we get engaged, what's the matter, are you okay, you look a bit different today. You know, you can get right into other people's worlds because what's happened? Who cares what's happened? If it troubles you and you want to tell me, you tell me. If you don't want to tell me, I don't need to know. Oh, but, but what has happened? You don't know. You know, we're off balance because somehow our concern for the other has been destabilizing for the self. And so in order for me to restabilize myself, I need to know what you're thinking about. Are you okay? So much of conversation is like that. Only if you get stable can I be stable. But the other person is stable in their instability. Have you ever stabilized anyone else? It's very difficult to do. So they just do what they do. But I don't like it when, you, when you're when you like that. You're getting to me because I'm letting you get to me. I'm getting to get you to get to me. That's my activity. So when we're talking about one-pointed attention, it's to slow down that very developed quickness of reactivity that we have. Maybe I don't need to do anything. So that's an emotional beginning that I have to kind of allow myself to relax from my task of using the events of the world in their impact on me 
as a proof that I exist. The ego says, what about me? What about me? What about me? This must, this must have to do with me. I'm sure it has to do with me. It's mine. A thought arises in your mind. It's your thought. If it's your mind, then it would be your thought. If the letter comes through your letterbox, probably it's for you. The question is, is it your letterbox? From the teachings, he says the mind is open like the sky. There's no letterbox. It's just passing through. It's a thought which is appearing, revealed in awareness, and appropriated by ego involvement. So there you see the possibility. If you relax into the awareness, you don't have to block the thought. You're not going to become stupid. You're not going to anesthetize yourself and, and not be impacted. It's that the impact shows and vanishes, shows and vanishes. And there needn't be a reaction. It's just this. Just this. What will I do with it? Nothing. Just this. But if the ego takes it up, then it goes into got to do something, got to shape it. I don't want you to shape me too much unless I can shape you. Loving someone who doesn't love you is not much fun <laughs> because you're feeling the impact of them and you're not having any impact on them. Unrequited love, it's not sweet. So in the same way, events occur to us, we want to respond. And it's seeing the nature of that habitual response as the karmic habit formation which maintains the seeming integrity and truth and power of the ego self. When in fact, the ego self is simply a compositional tendency which attributes certain factors in the field to me and certain features in the, fact, in the field to you. So we're constantly dividing. This is you guys and this is me, but at another time I'm more relaxed and we're in it together so that you are me in the, in the sense of the immediacy of what's happening for me. And then sometimes I'm just kind of looking at you, okay, you know, over there, okay. So I'm me and I can use your non-me to make me me. <laughs> so the aversion, the uh, pushing away of the other can bring a defined boundary to the self. Too much of that, we get lonely. So we go for fusion, for let me love you, let me get close to you. But then I get lost in that and now I need to come back. So we tend to be pulsing between fusion and isolation because it's very difficult for the ego to pitch it right. Too much, too little. This is the problem of duality and all the binary oppositions, that because it is a dynamic field which is shifting and pulsating, the control mechanism of on, off, more, less, more, less, means you're turning the dial all the time. Mm -hmm. So the function of one-pointedness, of shamatha, is to take your hand off the dial and start to trust that events arise and they won't harm you if you don't get involved. They're there. You don't need to annihilate them. It's like on the veranda. There was, last evening there were some wasps. And you're sitting there with your food and the wasp is going there and then it's going up your hand. Okay, hello. And you go, oh my God, the wasp. It's a wasp. This is the country. The wasps live here. I'm just a tourist. It's their territory. I've come into wasp land. Why would there not be wasps? I don't want there to be wasps. Well, don't live in the country. I'm here. There will be wasps. They will get close to me because they're quite kind of curious. What will I do? Generally speaking, if you don't do anything, they're okay. 
They are not vicious killers. They are reactive, and they will pick up something to react to if you react to them. So it's the same with these thoughts and feelings that arise. If you leave them alone, they don't cause trouble. So fusion and identification and immersion in the flow of experience is problematic because it reinforces the seeming facticity, the seeming givenness, the seeming truth of the ego, and that it has this particular shape or that particular shape. We have had many, many experiences in our lives. In these experiences, we have felt, this is me, this is how I am. And then it's gone. Something else is the case. We're identified with something else. This is me, and then it's not me. How is that possible? If it was really me, how could I be fused in it? I can't be fused in your mind. I'm out here. But it's as if sometimes you really connect with someone and you're in it, and then you're out of it. What feels like me is a feeling. It's not a truth. It's not a fact. It's a feeling tone. And it's the feeling of immersion, the feeling of wanting to have this immersion, which is the very nature of the ego. We say that the mind is like the sky or like a mirror. It's empty of its own content. The ego is a perverse form of that. The ego says, I am autonomous. I'm just me. Leave me alone. I don't need you. I don't need anything. I'm just myself. But of course, that's a lie. We need many things. So the ego is full, often full of shit. And it's empty and needy and hungry. So this is a terrible situation. This is why the Buddha says, don't stay like that. That's the cause of suffering. You have identified with a lie. You have an erroneous sense of self-identity. And as long as you are enmeshed in that identification, you're going to be terribly, terribly troubled. Because you will be filling yourself suffused, merged into something which is unstable and impermanent. Good times vanish. Bad times vanish. You can't hang, hang on to the good times. The bad times come and go. Everything which arises is impermanent and unstable. But in the moment when you have a fusional identification with what is arising, it is as if this is me. Like an actor plunging into the role so that she fully becomes the character. And she is the character. And people in the audience really appreciate her performance of the character because we all know she both is and isn't the character. The actress knows that, the other people on the stage knows that, and the audience know that. But if you can't believe that she is the character, you won't enjoy the play. So we're always swiveling on this point of believing. And what the Dharma is trying to do is just to open up a little bit more tension between these positions. It feels like this, but I know it's not really this. Okay, so what is that? That's an abandonment. If I have too much clarity, too much analysis, I go into an isolation. I'm just looking at the world and evaluating. And if I have too much fusion, I'm just caught up in it and I'm under the power of my anxiety or depression or loneliness or manic joy or whatever it would be that's filling me up in the moment. So the middle way is to bring these two together by seeing whatever arises is inseparable from the ground. So in order to have that awakening, first of all, we need to develop the 
capacity to give sustained, simple attention without immersion in the object that we attend to. And that's why in shamatha, we tend to use uh, kind of boring objects. <laughs> the crude form of it is to use uh, a pebble or a statue of the Buddha or a small painting of the white letter R. So there is some external focus that you can see or you work with sensation, particularly the sensation of the breath on the nostrils. And that's useful because you always keep breathing, so you've always got the possibility of doing that. And the other way, which we'll look at a bit later, is to have the focus of your attention on the space within which everything emerges. <coughs> so one is a, is a one-pointed attention to a specific form that you have decided on before you practice, and the second, without form, is to focus on the space within which every appearance arises and passes. So we'll start with the external form. And for our purposes just now, we can focus on the breath because we have that present with us. So we sit in a relaxed, easy way with the skeleton carrying our weight. Uh, sit as you can according to your body. Some people you can do the full lotus position or half lotus. The main point is to have the alignment of weight through the skeleton so that the muscles can relax. They're not having to hold you in place. The, the, the uh, aligned posture, <clears throat> you're now just hanging on the bones. And that's uh, easy. You want the diaphragm to be uh, relaxed and easy, so not a strong constriction around your waist. The gaze goes down the line of the nose. The eyes are slightly open. We're not staring at something, but just maintaining a mild connection with the environment. The tongue, we rest on the hard upper palate. It helps to stop the accumulation of saliva, and it's also uh, on a, a point which uh, increases alertness. Hands are in front of us, right palm on the top of the left with the, thumb, the thumbs touching. Shoulders are open and dropped and relaxed. And then we bring our attention onto the sensation of the breath going out and in, out and in. We're doing normal, easy breathing. You can have your mouth closed or slightly open, but the main focus is on the breath through the nostrils. If this seems a little bit vague, you can make a stronger intentional breath and catch the sensation and then relax into a more easy, normal breathing. If you find that your attention strays, if you wander off into a memory or a plan or an interpretive a sequence focused on what's happening or feeling bored or not wanting to do it, if you find that there is some mental structure which is more interesting than the sensation, as soon as you recognize that, just bring your attention gently back to the sensation. It's very, very important meditation never to blame yourself, <clears throat> to come to a conclusion that either the method is stupid or you're stupid or you can't do it. These are just thoughts. And our function here at the moment is to try to open a space where we are not at the mercy of concepts, of interpretations. So wherever your mind goes, if you find yourself wandering, just very gently bring yourself back to the breath and settle. Okay, let's do this for a while. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Okay. <clears throat> the mind is always moving. There's always the arising and passing of experiences, of thoughts, memories, and so on. With this practice, our intention is simply to keep our focus on something very simple. It's uh, quite a, a passive activity. We're just resting our attention on the movement of the breath. There is movement, which is the movement of the breath, but the attention is being stabilized. This is the opposite of the structure of karma, in which on the basis of the sense of my existence and the existence of the phenomena in the world, <clears throat> something arises for me in the flow of experience and formulates itself as an intention. I want to go for a walk, which is fairly neutral, or I want to help someone, which we might consider positive, or I want to steal something from someone or punish someone because I don't like how they've been behaving, which we might seem as negative. So the, the basis of karma, the foundation of it, is the dualistic positioning of I'm here, the world is out there. On the basis of that tension-filled dynamic, because we're having to separate self and other, the vibration of intention is a movement towards the environment to change the environment in some way. Ooh. You okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, intention uh, in Tibetan, sampa, which means a kind of organizing thought, is directed towards something and it becomes the basis of a mobilization which is the third stage of karma. I go towards the object of my intention and I act on it to transform it or certainly to transform my experience of it. So I come into conjunction with the object. So subject and object are now connected together. So we'll have a break soon and you might feel a bit thirsty so you go into the into the room and get some water, or tea or coffee. I want, I want something to drink. There is the object and then you get the, the glass or the cup and you bring it to your lips and you have the conjunction between the, the subject with a need or an intention and the object and you meet and you're drinking. That third stage is called um, jorwa, which means to join. Subject and object join together, and this brings a transformation in both the subject and in the object. You drink the tea, it's no longer available in the cup, but it has removed or assuaged your thirst. So then you have the fourth stage is, oh, that's good. You have a conclusion. Oh, okay, that's fine. Or you might be deciding you want to bite into a nice apple and you saw that there were lovely red apples on the table. But it could be that when you bite into the apple, it's a bit, it's a bit dry, a bit powdery. It's not, not very refreshing. <laughs> so then you don't have satisfaction with the object. <coughs> So these are the, the two main outcomes. Satisfaction and alignment, which thinks, oh, well, maybe I'll have another apple later. Or dissatisfaction, you think, oh, I'm not going to touch these apples again. So 
when you have that fourth stage of alignment, you have a kind of affirmation, <coughs> excuse me, of the value of the activity which you have just enacted. And that alignment of these four factors strengthens the karmic tendency that brings uh, repetition and consequences in the future. The reason I'm mentioning this is because that shows the normal movement of our intention. You want something, you mobilize your body, voice, and mind, saying if you're a child, you say, Mom, can I have an apple? And you, you set in chain a series of interactive activities. When we're doing the shamatha sitting, it's very different. Because it's a, an intention, I'm going to not deviate from having my attention rest on the breath. The, the mobilization bit is just that you sit, you arrange yourself, you decide, I'm going to focus on the breath, and that's it. There's not much more to do. So if, you're, if you decide you want to make some, I don't know, omelet, then you have to go in, get the eggs, get the pan, heat the butter, and go into the process of making the omelet. Here, you sit, now you, you're in passive mode. The breath is doing the work. The movement of the mind is now reconfigured or redefined as distraction. I'm not going to follow the distraction. I'm just going to stay on this. That's one of the reasons that it's quite hard to do this practice. On one level, it's very, very simple. But the whole general movement of our life in samsara is to mobilize with the intention and to keep the mobilization going until the subject and object come together. But we're, with the breath, attention as a non-fusional quality is a kind of safer sex. Because if you want to eat the apple, you consume the apple. You, you have intercourse with the apple. In, in the, the third term, in terms of karma, jorwa is also used for, for sexual union. But when you rest your breath, your attention on the breath, you're not merging into it. You're not avoiding it. You're not far from it. You're staying close to it, neither merged nor separated. And as many of you will know, this is the essential meditation instruction in all the schools of therapy. Oh, of, um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> getting old now, getting old. <laughs> in all the schools of Dharma. <laughs> because... not to merge and not to stand apart brings you to the middle point where you're present, <coughs> just present. And you can maintain, once you get used to it, you can maintain that balance. The dynamic tension to merge or to pull away will still be there because as long as there is a sense of a, a reified field, that is to say, <clears throat> I am a thing, I am a subject, I am this person, I'm used to being active and doing things, and the world has these objects which come to me with a feeling tone of liking and not liking, then we experience these, on the basis of this solidification, which is we call the first of the five poisons or afflictions, it's a mental dullness, it's an opacity that instead of seeing the brightness of the luminosity of the emergent moment, we conceptualize something is there, I'm here, this is there, and this is happening to me or I'm going towards that. So we have a movement of two separate objects and from this solidification you get desire and aversion. Liking leads to desire not liking needs to aversion. So this is the main bifurcation of energy as it moves towards the object. 
So keeping the attention on the breath is very difficult because you can only do that if you are free of these pushes and pulls of going towards or going away from. There's nowhere to go. This is just a really boring kind of experience. <laughs> there is no inherent excitement in the breath. It's just neutral. So we're saying, so it's almost like thinking of an electrical plug, you've got positive, negative and neutral. So we're saying, we don't want positive, we don't want negative, we just want neutral. Neutral is not doing anything. Nothing needs to happen. There is happening, the breath is coming and going, your attention is there, but it's not activating. The activation arises when you go off balance. For example, if you're standing and you're centered in the line of gravity vertically through the alignment of your skeleton, nothing much to do. If you tilt to one side or the other, now you're moving out of alignment with gravity and so there is a tension because the body, if it follows the pull of being off-centered, is going to topple you and so you resist this by tensing your muscles. You're pulling yourself back. You're restraining the urge to fall over. So that's exactly what happens when you move out of neutral in the focus of your attention. There is a mobilization of energy, which is either to follow the line of the off-center, follow the desire, or you resist the desire. Both of these involve some degree of contraction or mobilization, which is why just being calm, clear, centered is difficult. It's difficult. We're not used to being grounded and centered. We're used to being off balance. We're used to being available in that particular way. For example, when uh, a mother has a small child, there's a kind of extra attentive movement out into the field, listening for the cry of the baby in the night, being aware of the children playing, and then suddenly this silence, and they're thinking, oh, oh, children and silence doesn't go together. <laughs> What's going on? So that, that's what we would call being available. They're available through caring. It's an attentive availability that's already, as it were, connected out into the field. So this is what we're used to in various ways. This is why the, the meditation, although, again, it's simple and straightforward, is difficult because I am not interested in these things. That's what we're saying. So this uh, simple form of shamatha is essentially embedded in the Theravadan tradition, which is uh, in its roots, when the Buddha's first teaching, it's linked with the path of renunciation, with uh, giving up samsara in an outer form, becoming a monk or a nun, separating yourself from the, the hooks of society. You say to your parents, I am now a renunciate do not consider me your son, do not consider me your daughter. The family bonds of obligation are sundered today. I am a member of the Sangha, and therefore I will not be obliged to come if there is a family tragedy, because I am not in that world anymore. You, my parents, believe I am your child. You have woven me into the texture of your identity, but that's your weaving. That's a construct. I am not intrinsically your child. Now I am this. I'm a, a nun, a monk. So when we, when we do this practice, it is also a practice of renunciation. The outer renunciation of samsara is that you give up things like killing, 
like uh, alcohol, sex, uh, ambition, the desire to dominate other people. There are many, many lists of prohibitions that come if you take uh, a lot of formal vows. Because they are saying, you are vulnerable. You're not as clear as you think you are. You are going to get lost. And you need help not to get lost. So you're going to shave your head and you're going to wear unusual clothes so that when people see you coming down the road, they'll say, oh, this is a person who doesn't do kissing. <laughs> now you, with your shaved head, may be looking, oh, little kissing would be nice. <laughs> Would you like to kiss a bald person? <laughs> oh, why would you want to kiss? You are a holy nun. You get none because you're a nun. So that's, that's right. <laughs> and that's very useful. That's very useful because then you set up a social field which in a sense acts as a sort of super ego consciousness. Okay. It wags the finger for you if you can't do it for yourself. We are not usually in that kind of situation. So we have to stay on track. So we have to see danger without reifying it, without making it too strongly real, because as we know, everything is like a dream. It's like an illusion. And yet, and yet, it will harm you. If you're cutting with a sharp knife, you can cut your finger. The carrot is an illusion, the knife is an illusion, your finger is an illusion, and the bloody stump is also an illusion. <laughs> the fact that it's an illusion doesn't mean that it's not bleeding. So in the same way, getting lost is an illusion, it's not real. If you're deeply in awareness, it doesn't matter too much. Usually for yogis, there is no behavioral rule at all, except to be present, whatever's happening. However it is, this is how it is. But in terms of managing a life where there are many invitations and provocations, to have the sense of being able to maintain a neutral stance is very useful. Because it says, although my body through the senses might be saying, wonderful, I like, <coughs> excuse me, give me more. Now I can recognize, oh, that's a thought, that's a feeling, that's a sensation. It's only the neutral that allows you to see the deviancy, the pool. If you always follow your impulses, it just feels like me. I'm like this. If I see chocolate, I eat chocolate. What's the problem? And I think, oh, chocolate, me, desire. Desire is what links me to chocolate. It's not chocolate that makes me eat it. It's the desire. And the desire is pulling me off balance. So now I start to see what the five poisons are reification or obscuration, desire and aversion, and then pride and jealousy and all these mushroom out from these three basic ones. So the neutral is important. Let's have a break and we come back and do some more practice. Okay. So we have a, <clears throat> a wonderful opportunity here to be surrounded by nature in all its many different forms. And it also gives us an opportunity to look at what human beings do. Because when you look at the trees and the pattern of the branches and the leaves, and then you look at the building, they are very, very different. Generally, you can say there are no straight lines in nature, but human beings only make straight lines. This is what we do. We impose order. So it's very helpful when you have some free time 
just to go out in the fields and see the grass and the flowers and the trees and relax and open to this and then turn around and look at the building. You, the building shows you the nature of construction. One thing and another thing and another thing and building up brick upon brick, piece of wood on top of piece of wood, tile upon tile on the roof. <clears throat> this is how the mind is operating through composition. Now, there is a great deal of creativity in that composition, but often it's hidden because it's a very goal-directed. So builders have to think about many different issues, whether the wood is seasoned enough, how to make sure that they, they get light in the summer, but not too much heat, and so on. It's a quite, if it's well done, it's a very sophisticated activity, working with all the different potentials of the situation. But if that gets over-directed, if there's a time limit and a tight budget, then you get more kind of coercion of the circumstances. Imposing order, making it happen on my terms, with less and less collaboration with the potential of the situation. So it's just very helpful to be able to reflect on that and to think, okay, are, they, are these really two different domains, nature and culture? The, the car park here has a border of cement blocks and then you have the trees and the trees are growing over the cement blocks. And we say, go back don't come in here and then we take some big sharp dangerous machine and we ruthlessly chop down these trees who only wanted life they're doing their surya namaskar every day calm shine sunshine and we go back why because we want life on our terms nature is interrupting culture we also sometimes become aware oh culture is interrupting nature and with climate change, we become more and more aware of this. So it gives us a chance to think, okay, how can human creativity find a modality which will allow itself to move in harmony with nature rather than against nature? And part of that, of course, means you have to start with appreciation of nature. What is the earth? What is under the earth? what is um, growing from it, what is a tree, what are different kinds of trees, what are these potentials? Just as if you were in a, in a business and you had to in, interview people to find uh, someone to fill a, a staff position, you would be looking at their qualities, their experience, their qualifications and so on. Because you would be thinking, if I don't choose well, I can bring someone into the organization who is going to be lazy or confrontative, troublesome, quarrelsome. This is a nightmare. Why would I want to invite in a nightmare? So I need to be able to assess the qualities. So it's the same with nature. Are we, are we at all aware of the qualities of different trees and bushes and potential? Clearly not. Most of the time, human beings are very crude. So it's just something for us to be aware of, because we're going to see, I think, sadly, a lot more disturbances in nature because, and how to think collaboratively. Already, of course, politicians are always talking about mastery. We're going to come up with some magical solution, mm -hmm. some great plan. We're going to sort it out. Trust mm -hmm. us. If we throw enough money at the problem, we'll solve it. <laughs> And this is a kind of stupidity, because it's, it's crude. If you want collaboration, if you want synergy, then you have to have a situation where everything is respected. Synergy is much more like jazz than an orchestral for composition. The, with the orchestra, you always have a conductor and you have the score, but to dynamic systems require that every person takes their place, plays their part with authenticity and integrity and 
with attention to the dignity and value of others. This is a complex task. So I think being in an environment like this lets you see what are the possibilities of harmony and how could it be more harmonious? Because, uh, you know, talk about mindfulness, but essentially, if we want to see what is there, mm -hmm. we have to start with perception. You get, in, according to the Buddhist tradition, you get two kinds of perception. You have pure perception, daknam, and you get deluded perception, trulnam. The difference is that with Dagna, the sense organs are open and receptive and allow the raw pulsation of the world to arrive. With delusional perception, you start with your idea, you project your idea onto the environment, and then you move around inside these constructions without ever tasting the freshness of what is the potential of the situation. So you dull yourself even before you begin. So you can see how this links with the practice we were doing this morning. That all the thoughts, feelings and so on that arise, they're not bad, they're not wrong. It's just that if you have habitual mobilization, you're mobilizing on the basis of a habit, of a mental construction, rather than the actual shaping of the environment. So our practice is to ease back on the uh, propulsion and enjoyment of mental activity in order to have more availability to the life of the senses so that we have a, a fine-tuned, nuanced relation with what we're receiving and then we receive and respond receive and respond, rather than imagine and project and enact, which is the normal egotistical way of behaving. So the function of the practice can be uh, enormously helpful. Here uh, in the afternoon, we usually have some activities for those who would like to engage in them. It's entirely a matter of choice. Um, so at 2.15 uh, today, there will be uh, two potential activities and also plenty of free time and nature to wander around in or have a sleep or whatever you would like. To. Because if you don't have a choice, how will you know how you are? <laughs> This is not a military camp. It's up to you. And if you sleep, nobody's wagging a finger. And if you're very active and you clear the tables and you're smiling and very helpful, you don't get a gold star. <laughs> it's just as you like, as you choose. Because if you see how you are, that's what we look at, how I am. Not how I think I should be or how I have to be in order to get other people's approval. These are very delusional mental preoccupations. I want people to like me. Why? Who are these people? You don't know the people. You imagine these people. Why do you want your own imaginary friends to like you? <laughs> if you imagine them, why not just imagine they're your friends? Then you can just lie and sleep and snore. <laughs> <laughs> What are you up to? Who are you in service of? This is a really big question. What do I mobilize around? Like we were looking at karma, the intention. What is the ground of my intention? If we are still children and we're looking for mama and papa's approval, then that's a bit difficult. We're getting old. We're, some of us are heading towards death, maybe quite soon. Whose approval do we need? The danger with approval is, again, you're aligning towards your mental notion of what is required. And it takes you away from authenticity. I am as I am. Not I am what I am. That would be a construct. But I am as I am. And therefore, I need to pay attention 
to the emergence of myself in these different situations. So uh, one possibility is to do some uh, movement with uh, Jaya Chitta. Um, would you like to say something about that? Yes. Um, Jaya. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, quite a few of you are familiar and have joined in sessions before. So what James just said about ourselves co-arising with the environment and with each other, uh, that's a field also of meditation but also of improvisation. So we're going to take this into our own bodies, observing uh, how we arise in our body and how we arise in interaction with each other, with a partner or as a whole group. Uh, so it's very playful, it's very light, it's maybe a little novel or surprising what comes about for individuals, but it's a wonderful thing to do. So I'll be doing that for about 45-50 minutes uh, behind the house, in front of Benedict's and uh, Frank's <laughs> tent. They have a prime position to watch it. Uh, so I think that's the best place. So just um, if you just want to try it out, you're all very welcome. Thank you. Super. One, two, one is it? Two fifteen. Thank you. Oh, oh. you don't. Want no, this, I don't do want. You, <laughs> <laughs> you could have left. <laughs> <laughs> and Anna, Anna's going to say something about the second activity, which is uh, blessing pots. Hi guys. Um, back in 2019, before we had this whole uh, COVID adventure, uh, James was introducing uh, some techniques and one of these was uh, earth masses. So the idea is uh, that we fill pots with all our good wishes uh, to return our thanks to earth, but also um, with the strong intention to be, bring uh, elements into a rebalancing because apparently they are very much out balance. And uh, we do not see this only with climate change, but also with uh, our rising emotions, the strength which, with which uh, war is happening, with which uh, uh, most strange things are happening in, uh, in this um, world right now. So um, um, whoever is interested in participating in filling these vases, uh, or who also brought uh, things in order to fill these vases and learn about this practice, uh, you're very well invited uh, to meet mm -hmm. right here at uh, quarter past two and we are going to start mm -hmm. to do this uh, together with the best of our, our uh, wishes and intention. Thank you. Good. And then uh, we'll probably be doing these pots at least for a couple of days and then uh, in two days time we'll start uh, using molds to make images I brought four molds, two of Padmasambhava and two of Amitayus, the Buddha for long life. Uh, and that's a very nice activity to do, saying mantras and making images. And then we'll bless the images. And you can put them out in nature with a similar kind of function of uh, rectifying some of the imbalances. But also, if you take the time and we have plenty of clay, you can make a lot of them and make little pilgrimage routes where you live so that when you go for a daily walk, you can embed them in the wall of someone's garden and you walk <laughs> past them, you remember. And embedding the world with these remembrances is very helpful. You know, if you lived in a Tibetan village, you would have stupas, you'd have prayer flags everywhere, there'd be a little monastery, you would hear the puja sounds coming out, you would have a shrine, uh, we don't have any of that. It's all up to us. And so that, again, makes you very internal. And I think if you can put things out in the world <clears throat> and you have a sense that you're relating to the richness of the world and you start to believe that the world is indeed the display of the ground, it's the pure mind of the Buddha which gives rise to all experience, <clears throat> then that's probably helpful for practice. So. We'll be doing that in a couple of days' time. Creativity 
is something that we are all engaged in. Each moment is new. Each act is creative. Even the dull stupidity of our mind is creative because we make the darkness of our own assumptions and then we sit in that darkness. We do that. Nobody's doing it to us. So whether we are making clarity or making unclarity, these are activities. Now, in the West, we have these special uh, ways of cutting up society. We have artists who can express things on behalf of society. Uh, they can be seen as special people with special talents. Uh, as we know, in many cultures, artists were seen as people who were channels or expressions of the potential of God or beauty coming into the world. To create, to bring something into creation, means that you've rearranged the pattern of stuff. A lot of people might believe if when they look around their house that they have a lot of stuff. Do we need more stuff? Does the world need more stuff? Ah, but some stuff is special. Let's have more good stuff and less bad stuff. So we should recycle bad stuff into good stuff. But we still have stuff. So when we try to bring massage dharma into our life, we can see that you make a painting, or you buy a painting, and you hang it on the wall, and you believe it's there. And every time you look at it, you look at the same painting. Is this true or not? How do you know it's the same painting? It's this painting now, according to these circumstances. The outer factors of the illumination in the room, the inner factors of your mood, your availability, and so on. Each moment is fresh. You can use a painting to convince you that it's not fresh. Oh, I love this painting. I remember 20 years ago I bought it. Every time I look at it, I think back how happy I was then. This is a beautiful painting being used as a hammer to hit you on the head. <laughs> You're not fresh then. So the, the, the key thing is always when you start to tell the world what it is, pause for a moment and see, is the world in front of you, bowing to you with hands together, <laughs> saying, please tell us who we are. We are lost orphans. <laughs> you are our savior. Give us meaning. Give us hope. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> no. You vomit onto the world, <laughs> and then you enjoy the colors of what you have chewed around in your stomach. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. Your memories, your interests, your desires projected onto the world. Yeah, that's why we need to have this <clears throat> capacity to rest in the neutral position, not avoiding what we see as horrible in the world, and therefore avoiding the counter movement, which is to try to improve what we see in the world and not falling in love with what we see in the world and seeing it as being intrinsically special. It is special for me. Everything is co-emergent. The conjunction between the potential of this space and the potential of the mind or in Buddhist language, the Dharma Datu as the field of experience and Rigpa as the site of awareness. When these two move together, then you have the, the situation, which is another way of describing uh, Mahamudra, in which um, the, uh, the mudra, the uh, is the, the truth or the wisdom of emptiness. And this emptiness is uh, 
the shining quality of awareness. And then you have the other part, the maha, which means expansive. In, in uh, Tibetan, it's a chakye. Chak means like hand, and ge means to expand. And the gepa is the movement of all the potential which fills emptiness. So <clears throat> these are the two key elements of experience. Depth, which is infinite emptiness. You never get to the end of it. You can't find the top, the bottom, front, back. There is no reference points, just infinitely open. And inside that, there's moment by moment this incredible diversity of display, which is always changing. The inseparability of these two is the Mahamudra. So this is our life. This is what's actually happening, moment by moment. Your mind is moving with the field. And if you see it, you see the movement of the field and the movement of your mind simultaneously. Your breath is moving in and out. Thoughts, feelings, sensations are arising. Colors, shapes are emerging and dissolving. This is a Mahamudra. But when we grasp at it, when we think there is some reliable thing out there, and I am this reliable thing in here, then you have conflict. Then you have shaping and appropriation, and life becomes more dull. So creativity as participation in the process of creation becomes liberating when you see that what is being created is experience. Nothing has ever been created, but what we have is a lot of experience. Now, what is that experience? It is the luminous surface of emptiness. Moment by moment, through the body, they have sensations. They arise, and what are they? They're just shimmering moments, maybe pleasure, maybe painful. That's an interpretation, pleasure and pain. If you just stay with it, it's ungraspable. Ceaseless movement, which doesn't stop, inseparable from emptiness. Creating, but not creating anything, creating the moment. Now, usually, if you want to create something, if you want to bake bread, you get the flour and the water and salt and whatever, and you put it in a bowl and you mix it and you knead it and you let it rise and then you have to put it in the oven. And so there's a whole linear sequence of movements. You're moving through time. Mahamudra practice and Dzogchen practice are concerned with the instant, with the immediacy. So some of you are more familiar with the language of Dzogchen where we say the ground, the basis is primordial purity. From the very beginning, it's always fresh because nothing has stuck, nothing has arrived, nothing is solidly there. It remains an open potential, but this open potential shows itself in an instant as Hlundrup, as arising all at once. Hlundrup it means like a, a mountain or a, a hill, and Drup means arriving as or accomplished as. It's, it's already here, all at once-ness. So it's always open and it's always all at once. And this is the nature of our creativity. It's not producing things, it's producing this ceaseless movement of experience. So when you get up in the morning, you hear sounds, you open your eyes, you look around, clean your teeth, you have a pee and so on. All of these are experiences. Now you can run an interpretive storyline about it, a narrative which confirms that you are who you are and this is the sequence of your days and so on. But if you don't run that interpretation, it's just this, arising and vanishing, arising and vanishing, self-arising and self-vanishing, like the reflection in the mirror. Now, this is the heart of our practice. In order to stay with the freshness, we need to have stability, or 
as is described depth and openness or the vast expansiveness of all appearance. That's why developing the capacity for focused attention is important. Non-distractedness keeps you here. And when you are here and you are not moving, what you notice is movement. It's moving. I'm not moving. It's moving. Oh. So if it's moving and I'm not moving, point number one is it's not my fault. <laughs> I didn't do it. But that's a relief for some of us. It's just doing itself. That's what Lundrup means. It's doing itself. You will find the same uh, understanding in Mahamudra when we start to look into the text. It's not done by me. It is done, but it's not done as in something finished at the end of a process. It is immediately done. Zokpa Chembo, already complete. Or as Norbu, Nankai Norbu called it, self-perfected. It's nobody's done anything onto it. It is not artificial. It's not put together. It's just and like this, and then like this, and like this, and like this, moment after moment after moment. So when we see the world it doesn't need me, <clears throat> ego is not so relevant. But I am not irrelevant because I am the awareness of the irrelevance of the ego. <laughs> It's a win-win situation. <laughs> All the work that goes into composing yourself as somebody who has to do this and is very important and so on, that's released and you're just fresh. And then energy arises through you as you. This is our life. You're hearing me talking and who's talking? You can say James is talking, but who is the James? We, this conventional interpretation makes us stupid. I am talking, but I don't know what I'm going to say. Now, there are some psychotherapists in the room. They might be <laughs> suggesting I get some treatment. <laughs> Why don't you know what you're going to say? How could I know what I'm going to say? How could I know what I'm going to say? Because the whole nature of I am is I am with you and the connectivity of the situation brings forth the words. This is the whole thing. It's a conjunction. So in the tantric tradition in Tibet, they talk a lot about treasure texts, about how Padmasambhava, when he was in Tibet, he took many teachings and he wrote them in special form, or they were copied out, by, especially by Yishit Sogyal in Dakini script on yellow paper and hidden away and so on. And then later on, Someone who had a connection with Padmasambhava, someone who was a reincarnation of one of the 25 disciples, finds a key and finds the treasure and brings the treasure into the world. What does that mean? Conjunction, connection, everything arises in connection. I'm talking like this because you're here. It's just like that. Why would I talk like this? Not necessary. I do it because of why we're here. I'm arising according to circumstances. You're arising according to circumstances. The circumstances are the patterns in the shifting field which temporarily we are enjoying together. I'm not doing it. It is doing through me. We are each the medium of the expression of the energy of the ground. This is, if we see this, then we see, oh, but my ego interpretation says I'm doing it, and maybe I'm doing it well, and maybe my mum would be happy to know that her poor lost boy has suddenly found a role in life at the age of 73. <laughs> <laughs> well done, mum. <laughs> so, in that kind of situation, we see the retraction 
of wanting a game. We want to be creating something to produce stuff, to produce a commodity that can be traded in the world. And people say, oh, that was helpful. If I say, oh, I'm glad I was helpful. No, that was helpful. I wasn't the, the doer of the helpfulness. What the person got was helpful. What they got is not necessarily what I gave. I don't know what anybody gets here. I don't even know what I give, because as soon as I say something, I'm saying another bloody thing, and what I've forgotten what I said before. Because if I didn't forget what I said before, how could it be self-arising and self-liberating? It would be self-arising and then layered. And then I would forget the sequence, and then I'd have to write it down, and then I'd have to hold it up and read it to you, so that I would know what I was saying. We don't trust connectivity. We become anxious. Will it be okay? What will you think? So I better prepare. What will I prepare? What would be good for you? How would I know what would be good for you? Each person here has moods and fluctuations and feelings and is available and then unavailable and is daydreaming and doing this and that. How could I know what's good for you? It's not like that. It's a moving field and we engage into the field with the pulsations and some of it is a caress and some of it just passes. Well, what was that all about? I don't know. <coughs> anyway, quite nice being here. It's warm. <laughs> with the holiday. And then some, some, somehow there's something of, of meaning. If you look directly at your experience, you find it's like this. It's ungraspable. That's what the texts are saying again and again. It's ungraspable. When you grasp what you get, it's not this, it's that. It's what? It's a substance. You have to commodify the world in order to get it. We live in a time of commodity capitalism, where everything is turned into a saleable item. For example, some British people went to Ukraine. Some of them volunteered to fight in the Ukrainian army. Some of them have been captured by the Russians. They are not just a prisoner of war. They are a tradable commodity. They get paraded on television. The British government is under pressure to give money and resources to get them freed. Anything can be turned into a commodity. We know about slavery. We know about child sexual abuse, in which predatory people can do things to children because they see them as something which they can make use of. Our uh, attention to awareness is completely other than that. We are not about commodification. Commodification is the energy of unawareness. It's what arises as the field of experience when you don't see the ground. It is the energy of the ground in forgetfulness of the ground, and so appearance appears to be the appearance of something. And then we are in this representational attitude. You hear a sound, oh, what bird was that? Does it matter that you are able to stick the name of a bird on the bird? And if you stick the English name, it won't be the same as the German name. So what is the real name of the bird? Ask the bird. Exactly. We don't, we don't find the world by grabbing it, by naming it, by labeling it. So we'll be cycling and spiraling around this again and again. Because this is the heart of Mahamudra. The world revealed through concepts in the world as direct revelation are not inherently different, but they are not the same. When you see the ground, everything becomes lighter and you see that it is part of the ground. When you don't see the ground, you experience a world of things. These things don't exist. They are delusion. They are false interpretation. The bright, illusory nature of the world, like a mirage or a rainbow, the ungraspability, when you don't see this is a rainbow in the sky, 
you think the rainbow is a thing, we can get it. In, when I was a child, they always said, oh, at the, at the end of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you never get to the end of the rainbow. And that's a very deep teaching of life. Because if you pursue illusory forms and you think you'll get to the real substance, you never get there. Just another illusion and another illusion. And that intoxication with illusion is called delusion. And it's what most of us live in. And it's very painful because you concretize an interpretation of who someone is or how they are and what you're entitled to accept, uh, uh, expect from them and then they disappoint you. We know these stories. People are not who we think they are and we are not who we think we are. And yet we are committed to trying to work it out by adding more thoughts into a situation where thinking hasn't worked. That's the teaching. Let go of the intoxication of thought. Okay, so we do a little bit more sitting. The same practice as before. It gets a little bit warm, which tends to make you a little bit sleepy if you're tired. If that happens, intensify the depth of your breath, loosen your diaphragm a bit more. And you can open your gaze and look around and have a sense of space and then come back into the practice. The important thing is not to turn the practice into a battleground, not to be struggling against yourself to try to do the meditation. <laughs> what would be the point of that? If your body is tired, then you can just relax a little bit, open to the space and sit with that. And then if you feel a bit more refreshed, you come back into the practice. The reason that there are so many different meditation techniques is that it can sometimes be useful to move through a sequence of different practices if you're maybe suffering great physical pain or you're very, very tired or you're very confused about life that changing the angle of your participation can provide some relief when, when life seems very dense and sticky. Because if you're in it and you struggle, a bit like being in quicksand or in a swamp, if you struggle, mm -hmm. it tends to suck you in more. So by moving your position, you can stay light. You are not the enemy. The content of your mind is not the enemy. So, just let it go. Okay, so we sit in a comfortable way. <clears throat> Spine and skeleton taking the weight. We sit again for about half an hour. Okay. With the teachings on the mind in uh, Mahamudra and Sokshen uh, generally focus on two aspects, the empty aspect and the knowing aspect. The knowing aspect, in order to stay close to the empty aspect, has to be able to know nothing, <laughs> to be aware of nothing, to open to nothing. The mind The minds that we have as minds conditioned and processed in samsaric interaction usually find this quite difficult. Our mind tends to function as somebody knowing something. 
in the tradition is just called consciousness. These words as they come into European languages are difficult because in some traditions consciousness sounds very high and noble and in others it sounds more ordinary. In the Buddhist tradition generally consciousness, vijnana, uh, namparshepa means a mind looking for something, catching something, holding on to something which is what we bring into the meditation practice. So we sit and we want to get something. It's not that we consciously want to get something, but the very structuring of our experience is that we're always looking for something. The mind is hungry. And the reason is this, consciousness takes an object. It needs an object. So for example, if you're sitting outside and it's very quiet, you could say that your hearing consciousness is quiescent, it's quiet. And then there's a kind of rumble, could be thunder, could be a plane. And you become conscious of the ear consciousness. So in the tradition, we have five senses. Each of them has their own consciousness. Seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. These five consciousnesses provide partially cooked information to mental consciousness, which is the main interpreter. It's not fresh, fresh. It's like the kind of rice you buy in a supermarket nowadays, which is called parboiled, half boiled. It's already prepared. It's not like rice you get in a village in India. You cook it very quickly. She says, oh, cooks in 20 minutes. Really? Probably rice doesn't do that. If you buy organic brown rice, it takes longer. So what we get through our senses is already a little bit cooked. It's a little bit prepared. Some ingredients have been added because we have selective <coughs> attention. Our sense organs are not an even agency. They, we're looking for something. We're listening for something. So this is the difference between seeing, where you just see, and you look. If you look like a detective, you're looking for evidence. You've already got some idea in your mind of what you are looking for. And so that simplifies the field but it also makes you blind to the field because now you're focusing on some particular thing. And that's the same, you know. You, there might be a, an ordinary scent around and then there's suddenly something different, maybe a perfume or a flower, or you stood in dog shit, there's some explosion. I thought, whoa, oh, what's that? What is that? That's our normal reaction. What is that? Something has impacted and I want to know what it is. There must be some substantial cause for this experience to arise. So if we see consciousness is looking for something, which means the subject, the ego self, operating in the world is trying to find objects that will confirm its own validity. When we're looking for something, we're usually looking for two things, advantage and disadvantage, which brings us back to desire and aversion. We seek to find more of the things we like and less or fewer of the things we don't like. Yes. <clears throat> Consciousness is not the vehicle for awakening. Consciousness is the vehicle for the maintenance of samsara. You can't think your way out of samsara. You can't make sense of it so that you suddenly get an insight. You can get insight into another layer of samsara. So you might be studying a mathematical problem or reading a play and suddenly, oh, so that's what this trying to do. Oh, but now you've got a thought about the thought. It's an illuminating thought a thought that provides a conceptual light 
but that's not the natural light of the mind. So, again, that's why distraction is very easy, because we are predisposed to scan the environment for advantage and disadvantage. What are they up to? Could I get something useful here? So when thoughts, feelings, and sensations arise, we have a, a tilt towards them as if what is occurring has something for me or is meaningful to me. We're predisposed, pre-tilted. What's going on here? So it's very difficult to us think, uh -uh, this is not a what. If you can just stay with the arising, it's gone. And it wasn't a, th a what, it was just like a, like a sound in the sky. Or you see a bird flying across the sky, it doesn't land anywhere. It's just something moving through the space of the mind. But when it appears in this solidified form to us, that's how we hook our attention. So the key thing to be aware when you do the practice is, oh, this is helping me to see what consciousness is. As long as I am located in the matrix of consciousness, I will be pulled into duality. Or to put it another way, duality reveals itself as the movement of consciousness. So uh, the elaboration of this view is to say there are eight consciousnesses. There are the five sense consciousnesses, providing their mediated or interpretive sense through the senses. Then there is mental consciousness, which provides the formulated interpretation of what's happening. Then the seventh consciousness is the resource bank of the afflictions or the poisons, the, these five poisons we've talked of, the mental uh, opacity, the lack of clearness, the dullness of the mind, that is to say it's a reifying, solidifying aspect, the somethingness, and then followed by desire, aversion, jealousy, and pride. And then the eighth consciousness is called the ground consciousness, or sometimes the store consciousness. It is the consciousness which is the basis of everything. Now here we have to hear everything as every thing. Every isolated element, every entity is held or has a base on the ground consciousness. It's called uh, Alaya Vichnana or Kunji Nampashepa. So, Because this is essentially beyond speech and thought, it's difficult. We have to rely on technical terms. And the danger with the technical terms is you feel that the technical term is the truth. So if you understand the term, you've got it. No, you've just got the truth. You know. You've just got the word. And the word of the truth is not the truth itself. So you have the ground in Sokshin that was talking about the ground. The ground is not the ground of everything. The ground of everything is the ground conceptualized as a source of something. So we refer to the ground as the source. And this is where language is difficult. We say it's the source of everything, but not everything. Everything is the source of all. No things involved, but wow, all of this. Not all of that, all of this. <laughs> Don't know how to say this. So, but you can do it for yourself. If you have some time this afternoon, walk out on the fields, it's all of this. You don't need to know the names of any of the kinds of grass or trees or brushes or name the clouds or the birds or anything, just all of this. All of this immediately. What is it? Ungraspable. You get a sense there of this ceaseless flow, the source ungraspable, the display ungraspable, the vanishing inexplicable. It's just, whew, whew. that's like the ground. 
But if you are kind of trying to stabilize your own sense of who you are, then well, what is it? What is that? What's that called? Where does that road go? Oh, it's a car. Someone else arriving a bit late. What's going on? When you come into that, then you're seeing that there must be a basis for all this somethingness, this mm -hmm. stuffness. So materiality is a thickening mm -hmm. of the immaterial. In that sense, it's like a, a, slow, a, a lowered vibration. As the vibration starts to become insistent and dominant, we have a sense of being here before, know what this is, and then you have the basis for accumulation because this is like that. Oh, I remember, are you, I've seen you before. Hey, we talked of this. And you start to build up a story and you're into something and it's quite interesting and it feels connective. But what I'm saying is you're probably who I remember you to be. So I'm mediating your freshness in terms of my memory. And I want you to confirm that I'm not yet demented, so please <laughs> <laughs> confirm my memory. <laughs> and in that way, we think, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm not daft. I, I know things. I know things. So this is consciousness. Consciousness is not wrong or bad. It is a, a modality of the potential of the ground. If we remember... The ground is open, it's equal to samsara or nirvana. It's the ground of both. It doesn't have bias. It is neutral. Could be clear awareness, could be grasping consciousness. Either it's just an illusory formation. The difference is awareness is self-reflexive. That is to say, the presence of awareness is self-illuminating. And so it sh it's awake to its own emptiness in the moment of the revelation of an experience. Consciousness is not like that because it's tilted towards the other. So I'm conscious of something and the something out there confirms the meanness in here. So you then get duality being built up as a kind of reverberation, which is, becomes a confirmation, I exist. And that leads into, <clears throat> excuse me, into selective attention. So this is, uh, this is something we can just observe for ourselves. We don't, we're not in a rush to change everything, just starting to explore how can I be attentive to the unfolding of my experience in trying to just turn the light on, turn the dimmer switch up a bit. So what am I up to? When you have a judgment or an opinion, don't stop it, don't change it, just observe what is a judgment. Oh, I'm patting myself on the head, I know something. Oh. That's the function. I know this, confirming this. Dualistic judgment. You just see, oh, I'm doing quite a lot of that. I'm doing quite a lot of that. I am creating the reality of myself through judging the qualities of the object. Does that make sense? So you can see, oh, this is a process which seems to be confirming the existence of something prior to the running of the process. I'm doing this. I have always been here. I am self-existing. You may call me God if you like. <laughs> I am. But actually, this is part of the process. It's part of the movement. There is stillness and emptiness, which is empty, empty, and there is movement, which is bright and shining. The ego 
is in the family of movement, but says, I am, I am what I am, <laughs> which is not true. <laughs> it's a lie. It's a lie. We are living a lie. So if you observe that for yourself in the moment that it arises, this is a revelation or a process or a showing. It's not showing something. It is creating something. That is to say, the something is the product of the showing, not the source of the showing. Just to complete that cycle, the ground of everything is groundless. It's unborn. There is no source of everything because everything is an illusion. So we have to stay with impermanence. It's, impermanence is truly our best friend. You can't catch that which has already vanished. By the time you know what it is, what you catch is the concept. Concepts are very thin food, so you need to have a lot of them. <laughs> Time for lunch. <laughs>
is a construct, is a pattern. If you meet someone and you want to tell them about yourself, you describe activities or experiences, you talk about something. When I was a child in my family with these number of people, this is the kind of food we ate, this is the television program I like most. So, so the ways in which people introduce themselves, they talk about themselves as if there was a self apart from the one who is talking. So who is talking? Well, I am. I am telling you about myself. So I, the talking subject, can tell you about myself, the talked of object. So there you see that the movement of duality, the separation of subject and object, becomes the kind of vibration that allows us to deal with the world as if it's full of separate, discrete entities which we move around, as if it was a chessboard you move forward and back. Who is this one who is claiming this position? It is a concept. The concept arises in the mind and the concept claims to be the owner of the mind. How is that possible? It happens in many countries in the world. The army stages a coup. The army is paid by the state and some captain or major leads a coup and declares himself to be the president. I become the state. That's a coup. That's what the ego is. It's a coup. Something which is a member of the state, something which is within the movement of the mind, claims a separate status. I'm looking at you. I'm going to tell you who you are. This is what the, what the dictator does. He defines the rules of the game by saying the rules of the, of the game don't apply to me. Hmm. You are the object. I am the only subject. Hmm. So this is the ego. It gives itself a different rule book. And it says, everything is visible to me. I am visible to me, but you can't see me. Then, of course, it gets lonely because we want to be seen. But nobody can actually see us because there isn't really an ego. Can you see what I see when I imagine me? It's a strange question. How could you? because I don't always imagine myself in the same way. So it's an act of imagination, a creativity that we were looking at just before the last break. The factors of construction come together and we create this feeling tone validated. It feels right, it feels true. This feeling tone validated sense, I exist. And then on the basis of that, you can accumulate many different kinds of experience. So it then appears to me that I have an ongoing security of presentation. I exist through time. There is something unchanging about me. The problem for this is the constituents, the, the aspects out of which I am forming, are in time. So how can movement in time create something outside of time? It's very easy. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The mind imagines God. Whether God imagines the mind, I don't know. I don't believe so. But human beings certainly imagine God. Immortal. Invisible. God only wise. Why not? Invent anything you like. You can invent the people's <coughs> republic of a country which is actually a dictatorship. 
You can imagine anything. You imagine God. You imagine yourself. These are imagined fantasies. They don't exist. Not available. But you can imagine them. And if you imagine them, then it is as if they are real. God is no more real than Donald Duck. But you can believe in Donald Duck. And you can say things about Donald Duck because there are many books about Donald Duck and you can read them and you can memorize them and you can read the Bible and memorize many things about God and then you can tell the story about God and the story about Donald Duck. This is the mind. This is not to insult theistic religions, but it's to understand that movement can generate the illusion of stasis. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> that is God. <laughs> <laughs> I object. <laughs> I should tell you, uh, you are not right. <laughs> At least he didn't throw a thunderbolt. <laughs> so the traditional example for this is uh, if you had an outside fire on a dark night and you took one of the burning pieces of wood and you swung it around your head fast enough, you see a circle of fire. Or rather, it is as if there is a circle of fire. Clearly, if your arm is not moving at the right speed, you won't see a circle of fire. The movement is generating the seeming stability of the circle of fire. Yeah? Just like in the old-fashioned cinema. You're running the film at the right speed in front of the bright light and you get the continuity, the seamless continuity of the film. It is the movement of the mind that generates the delusion of something static. So we can, this is, it's not a dogma, you don't have to believe this. It's an encouragement to observe your own mind and see if it's true. That we all have made statements about ourselves, our lives, which have been true situationally, but not absolutely. And then the situation changed and we found we changed our mind. It's not that we had changed our mind. We found that our mind had changed. But we tend to say to someone, oh, I'm sorry, I've changed my mind. But we didn't do the changing. It, it arose for us because the patterning, <coughs> excuse me, within the flow of our experience shifts. It's dynamic. So again and again, when we do the practice, we want to be able to observe the arising and passing of the thoughts. We're not focusing on the thought. We're, we're using the sensation at the nostrils as a kind of anchor to give us something to, to hold on to in the stream of experience. So you're holding on to that, but the, it's going by. It's going by. So I think, oh. I can hold on to this uh, dynamic sensation in the midst of these arising and passing of thoughts. If we let go of the anchor, we fall into the stream of experience which is moving. And when you're in it, it can seem to be more settled, more guaranteed than it actually is. So the first basic thing we need in, in meditation is to realize my mind is always moving. It's not fixed. It's not settled, not in its mood, not in its sensation, not in its memory or thoughts. And then you start to see thoughts are gone. They're just very, very quick. When you get a linking of thoughts, the rapidity of the thoughts is like the speed in the cinema, which is getting the frames running at, at the right speed to generate the illusion of the continuity of the movie you're watching. 
So you're caught up in a flow of thought. You're thinking about something and you're mentioning, oh, if you're a bit obsessional, you think, oh, when I left my flat, did I really turn off the cooker? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, no, no. How will I know? It's a thought. You can't catch the thought, but somehow the, co the thought is catching you and the mind starts tumbling around. It arose and it's gone, but it seems to, it's agitated something. In that one thought is knocking another thought. Maybe I should phone my neighbor. They could, they have a spare key. They could go in and just check. That would be better. So now from that thought, a plan is unfolding. And when you're in that thinking what to do, there is a kind of intoxication. You're, you're <coughs> kind of like a very drunk person. You're just wrapped in this particular formulation for a while. And then you think, oh, that's what I'll do. In the evening, I'll phone them and they can go in and oh, that's better. And now you're released from that intoxication. But while you were in it, it's, you didn't experience it as a flow of things which was arising. You experience it as so, you sorting out the problem. You're kind of engaged, you're shaping. No? We've all had these kind of experiences. So that's why we want to stabilize the focus of attention so that we can really see directly the mind is always moving. So when I'm building up my plan of phoning the neighbor and asking them to do something, it's as if there's steps are being set out. A plan is being formulated. I'll do this and this and this, and then they can do that and that. And then when I come back, I can buy them a bunch of flowers because they've been really kind doing this. Da, da, da. Mm, so nice to have good neighbors. The previous people, God, they weren't so very nice. I wouldn't have liked them. Eh, there's no end to the amount of formulation you can do because one thought leads to another. And this, and this is the thing really to observe. Clearly, one thought is leading to another. So there's one and two and three and four, but somehow they become seamless and you become wrapped in the narrative. You're on the inside. You suspend disbelief. You're no longer thinking about it. You are in, immersed in that stream of thought as if it were you. So we spend a lot of our life in this situation. And that's why getting the stabilized attention here, allowing us to see the movement of these thoughts. They are not me, but they could be me if I gave myself to them. So, I'm in the bus station. There are many buses coming into the depot, emptying people, filling with people. I'm just nothing more to do, a bit bored, sit in the bus station. And then I get on a bus and it takes me where that bus is going. So that's meditation for most people. They get on a bus. They don't know why they go on that bus. They don't know where the bus is going. <laughs> I go somewhere. Oh my God, it's taking me to another bus station. How many bus stations are there? Endlessly. You get off one bus, you're in another station. More buses coming. I'm just sitting. I'm sitting. I'm in a bus. <laughs> and going on these little riffs, these little journeys. So that's so interesting. It's so important not to go into judging these things as negative or I made a mistake or I can't meditate, but just to see the dynamism, the thought becomes real or powerful for me if I give myself to the thought. It is by my merging into the thought that it becomes operative for me. Yeah? That's how it functions. So if I have a choice, that's one thing. But usually what we seem to experience in the meditation is that we slip into it. We just slip into it. We don't intend to. We seem to be having some clarity like 
walking on solid ground and suddenly it goes under your feet and you're in that thought. You get carried away by a thought. You merge into it. Now, the reason we can merge into the thought is because the looker or the, the one who is paying attention, the consciousness, doesn't actually have any content of its own. The mirror fills with reflections because structurally it's empty. Its emptiness is its availability to fill with all different kinds of reflections. So in a similar way, our mind can fill with all kinds of thoughts, happy thoughts, sad thoughts, stupid thoughts, wise thoughts. The key thing is to see the filling and the emptying. The filling and the emptying. It fills and it empties. It is a space of availability. When it's filled, it is also empty. So, I have a glass of water. When it's filled, it's also empty because it's not a paper cup. The water is not absorbed by the glass. If it was a very absorbent cardboard cup and I kept the water in it, it would start to dribble out of the bottom because there would be no boundary between the water and the container of the water. Yeah? But actually, when the reflection goes in the mirror, it doesn't taint the mirror. It's in the mirror. The mirror is full of the reflection. And simultaneously, the mirror is other than the reflection. Yeah? So there is water in the glass. Well, actually, water doesn't go into glass. Water could go into paper. There is water in the space of the glass. Yeah? The water, <clears throat> the glass is uncontaminated or untouched by the water because it's pour the water out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So your mind is filling with stuff which, in a sense, has nothing to do with you, but it can. So, what is the issue here? It is the porosity of the mind. The mind can be non-porous, semi-porous, and very porous. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, in the text when we read, the mind is vajra. This means completely non-porous. It's completely hard, indestructible, and nothing is absorbed into it. So this is a symbol of primordial purity. But consciousness moves between being porous and non-porous. This is why we get exhausted at the end of the day. Because, you know, if I rub my hands like this, yeah. I get some exercise from my muscles, but I don't get much friction. If I bring the hands together, I start getting friction. It is the contact that generates the impacting, which leaves a trace. So if I had oil on one hand and I rub the hands together, the oil would be transferred to the other hand. So if I'm in a stressful situation at work, mm. some of that oil or that flavor will be absorbed into me. And I'll come home and I'll just be a little bit, wow, too much. I don't need days like this. What is this? Because it's come into me. It's quite difficult to be connected with other people and not be touched. It's really, really difficult. We don't have Teflon. You can do any amount of professional training, but somehow it gets through. As we know from the story of Achilles, you can dip yourself in endless trainings and supervision and personal development, but somehow there's always a little bit of you that sucks it in. So that's what we experience, that absorbency. So the key thing is, well, could I make myself better coated against the world? Absolute wisdom. Everything is empty. No compassion. 
you're all empty. <laughs> Bye. <Yeah. laughs> but if you stay connected, little holes are appearing in the wall of emptiness. Because compassion is connectivity, and connectivity means I open to you, I'm available for you, and you get to me. I, I can't always titrate the dose of you. I like 10 cc's of you. <laughs> not more, no, no, I, that's just spot on, perfect. We get flooded, or we don't get enough. You have a conversation, you think, oh, I wish we'd talk more, I had wanted to say this. Or it was too much, oh my God, I thought I was just having a cup of tea and now my ears were. <laughs> you can't adjust the amount. So, in terms of meditation, the path of renunciation would say, yeah, do keep it away. You are vulnerable. You don't have Teflon. You're not Achilles. Keep the buggers away. I'm a monk. I'm a nun. Don't come near here. Nori me tangere. Oi. Don't do it. But it's not always effective. Because the world comes in, in all sorts of ways. The Chinese, when they invaded Tibet, were not very respectful of the status of monks and nuns. In fact, they took it as a provocation and, and used that to excite themselves and attack these monks and nuns. So there, there are few symbolic states which will be strong enough in their symbolism to absolutely direct the behavior of others. We interact and we get impacted. So how do we deal with that? One of the examples I've offered in the past is to say we should be like a, like a bar, an open bar to anyone, come in day or night. We have many drinks available and we have no bouncers on the door. Come in. But we have no back wall. If you come in, you go out. <laughs> Grab a drink on the way. Oh, you want whiskey? Have a whiskey. Whoop. Gone. Thoughts come and they go. Why don't they go? People say things and it gets to us. We imagine something and it gets to us. So that's, that's what we have to see is what, what is my part in the vulnerability of getting caught up in this entanglement, what am I doing? I'm taking it as real, as important, as solid. Something must be done. Something has happened. There has been an event. All events are impermanent, but it shouldn't happen. But it does happen. How can we stop wars? You can't. You can't. But how can you stop people being unkind? You can't. What are you going to do? Find the bad people and shoot them? People who shoot all the people they think are bad are probably considered to be bad by someone else. So a new government needs to come in to shoot the bad people who thought they were being good by shooting the bad people. <laughs> That's a chain of samsara. How, how do you work it out? You can't. It's not about subject controlling object. It's about being open as it arises, feeling the quality of the situation and seeing it's vanishing. It has gone. I am not thinking about what is happening. I'm thinking about what has happened. I'm thinking about an echo. I'm thinking about a ghost. Why would we be thinking about ghosts? That moment is dead, gone, irretrievable. What you have is a dead body, a rotting, rotting, ghosty, stinky thing which might touch you, cling to <laughs> if the zombie kisses you, you'll be a zombie too. If you've seen the movies, you should believe them, really. So you kiss the rotting moment of yesterday. 
I didn't like what you said to me yesterday. I was really upset. People say that. <laughs> Who said it yesterday? Was it me? Was <laughs> I there? How do you know it was me? We believe that people really exist, continue through time, and can be held accountable. This is the basis of law. And in one relative level, it's very useful. We like to have policemen who don't take bribes and who are honorable and take people to court for the proper crime. It makes us safe. But the person who is being held account of the action, is it the same person who did the deed or someone else? In court, they might say, oh, it was a moment of madness. I don't know why I did it. The judge says, ah, you are a rational agent under the law. Whether you know why you did it or not, you did it. We have witnesses. You will be punished for the crime. Then the psychiatrists get pulled in. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, Your Honor. See, if the person is not really aware that they did it, why would they be culpable? And the judge is thinking, if I could, I would arrest all the psychiatrists. They waste my time. They give me anxiety. <laughs> it's very simple. Bad people do bad things. Enough. <laughs> yeah, that's why life is difficult. Who did it? A thought pattern did it. A thought pattern did it. Some thoughts arose in the Russian mind, Mr. Putin's mind. Mr. Putin seems to have... Uh, a profound difficulty in communicating with people who disagree with him. So he's surrounded by people who agree with him or daren't contradict him. So he feels unimpeded. That's tragic because then you don't see the consequence of your action when you're intoxicated by the arousal for it. So this is all about shamatha, about how do you get a calm mind in the midst of the turmoil of attraction, aversion, involvement, disengagement. Not blocking the movement, but not falling into identification with it. Clearly, we need to see that the mind itself is space. The mind is not a thing. Now, if we believe that thoughts can be a thing, when the thought is vanishing as it arises, we see we can get deluded very easily. The thought's already vanishing. What, <coughs> what is the referent of the thought? Say, what does the thought refer to? Yesterday, I was in Frankfurt. So I am referring to Frankfurt. What is Frankfurt? It is a name. How many Frankfurts are there? Trillions and trillions of Frankfurts. There's not just one Frankfurt. Every time a thought arises about Frankfurt, on a particular street, in a cafe, people saying, I'll meet you next week in Frankfurt. All of these are constellating some Im image of Frankfurt. Will the true, real, genuine Frankfurt please stand up? We have 10 billion euros ready for you. Step forward. Who is Frankfurt? Doesn't exist. There is no Frankfurt. And yet, Simultaneously, there are billions and trillions of Frankfurts. Frankfurt is a linguistic signifier used to refer to patterns of experience which arise and pass, are ungraspable and non-replicatable. You can't repeat them. Does that make sense? You could say the same about Rome or Milan or, or any place. <clears throat> If you say Milano, it's referring to what? To ideas about Milano. Milan itself you can't find. You find many Milans, but no real Milan. <clears throat> so you apply that then to people. John, Mary, Maria. They don't exist. And yet they exist in multiple ways. They are multitude and not singular. 
So you can't say they don't exist because there are so many forms of Maria. She can show you photographs of childhood and all the things she's done and so on. Hairstyles, dress, many Marias. No one Maria who is Maria, who is Maria is whoever she is at the moment. And who is she at the moment? Well, which moment? That moment's already gone. You can't have that one. Get the next one. Oh, you're too far ahead. No. Yeah, you've got to be... <laughs> Jump. Get this Maria. Is this the real Maria? Oh, I don't have a Maria. I thought I got her, but she's gone. You observe your mind. This is what your mind is. The thought is of vanishing as you try to catch it. So the key thing from this is don't try to catch it. In, <clears throat> in all the different yanas, the different levels of Dharma practice, it says thirst, the desire to absorb the world and uh, unawareness of the actual nature of phenomena, these two are the main source of suffering. If you don't realize everything is illusory and uncatchable, you feel a thirst for it because I can't get enough of it. Because if I got more of more of whatever it is, oh, that would be that would be enough. Then I would be happy. But we never get enough. We never get enough. So that's something very, very interesting. The grasping is a delusion because we imagine that experience is a commodity. So, when you have an experience, see if you can catch it. When we have a break, if you have a cup of tea or you eat an apple, just experience eating and drinking or you look at a tree. Something's happening. Eyes are receiving something. You have some feeling tone in your body. But it's not really anything. It is and it isn't simultaneously. So that's at the heart of it. That's called the middle way, the middle way between existence and non-existence. You can't say that the apple really exists because it only reveals itself to you as an apple in the moment of its destruction. You are chewing the apple to death. And in its death, it gives you its last gift of the taste in your mouth. No. It's like that. You breathe in and you breathe out. Ungraspable. Therefore, why are we doing this? So this is the meaning of shine. Sit on your hands and don't do. But I want to do. I need to do. I have to do. It's what I do. I'm a human being, that's what we do. I'm a member of the club. That's why difficult to get out of samsara. Human beings don't get out of samsara. Buddhas get out of samsara. When human beings realize they're not human beings, they're Buddhas, then they already get out of samsara. But if they're a human being trying to be a human being getting out of samsara, they don't get out of samsara. <laughs> Because human beings are in dualism and full of grasping. And you can't grasp your way to enlightenment. Grasping. I need. So when we sit in the practice, we relax. Whatever comes, comes. Whatever goes, goes. The key point in that is to see the coming and the going. The coming and the going. This ceaseless emergence and vanishing of experience and you are calm because you are untouched by it so in the level of shamatha we've been doing we're focusing on attention which is a dualistic quality i am attending to the sensation of my nostrils i am doing it if i'm not doing it it's not going to happen so i'm doing it i am paying attention so that's subject to object. But because of the quality of that attention, it thins itself. And the ego energy that usually permeates my being in the world with others gets thinned out. 
All I'm doing is paying attention. I'm simply attending. Now, of course, what thickens it, what makes it not pure attention, is that we get distracted by opinions about what's going on or judgments on the process of our meditation or a thought, I can't meditate. There's some meta-commentary, some overarching investigation. Again and again, we just, if that arises, come back to the breath. Don't think about where you went. Don't analyze it. Don't try to explain it. Just back to the breath. Okay? So let's do a little bit more of that. And especially when the weather's hot, it's very important not to strive. If you push yourself in hot weather, you bring up a lot of more tension. So the mind wants to be just very relaxed and open. And if lots of distractions come, just again, come back, come back, come back. Okay. <coughs> well, before we looked at the example that uh, when you seem to get absorbed into a thought, it's like getting on a bus that takes you somewhere. That's what it can feel like, that you get transposed to another situation. But does the thought actually take you anywhere? Do thoughts go anywhere? Here? And they're gone. Where did they vanish? Did they vanish somewhere else? You are here. The thought is arising here. The feeling is arising here. But within the thought, it is as if you're somewhere else. So it would be like sitting with a drunk person in a bar. You're in the bar. You see the bar. Are they in the bar? Well, their body is in the bar, but their mind is rambling and moving all over the place. They're drunk in the bar, but it is as if they are not in the bar. They are intoxicated. They have toxicity. They are drugged. They have poison in them. So when we observe our experience, and hot afternoons are very good for that because it's a little bit heavy and dreamy and it is a, a kind of di natural diminishing of clarity with this feeling. And it's as if we go somewhere, but where have we gone? Just here. We're here, but we don't know we're here because we're imagining we're somewhere else. The thought is here, but it gives the impression that you are somewhere else. So this is like a, a micro version of the nature of samsara. We are actually always in the openness of the Buddha's mind, but mesmerized, intoxicated, somehow under a magical spell, it is as if we are somewhere else. And we have a formulation of where we are because we can give, to some extent, an account of it. So the key point is, whatever happens, whether it's happy or sad, whether you feel present or confused, light or heavy, stay present. How do we stay present? Well, we are present. We are present with the heaviness. 
the clarity of the mind is like the brightness of the mirror that shows the reflection. The mirror shows the reflection for two reasons. It has no content of its own, so it's available as a space for showing, like in a big old-fashioned department store, they usually had big windows at the front where they would show the items that they want to attract people in with. It's like that. It's, oh, this is on display. There has to be a space in which you show something. And there's a clarity, the windows are clean, you can see, oh, something is on display. What's on display is heaviness, tiredness, dreaminess, sinking. Very popular on a hot <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> it's very fashionable. <laughs> That's what's here. If you have the sense, I'm feeling heavy, I'm feeling sleepy, the light is on and off at the same time. You know you're getting a bit distracted or a bit lost. This is illuminated. So what you've got there is clarity and heaviness or dullness present at the same time. If you go too far into the dullness, you can go asleep and go unconscious, get carried away. The key point, as always, in all the books you can read about Mahamudra is don't struggle with it. Don't artificially try to impose a kind of clarity because artificial brightness will be produced by friction, by rubbing thoughts together and encouraging something. Stay simply present with how it is. So if the mind is dull, then you sit with the dull mind. If the mind is full of jealousy, sit with the jealousy. If it's full of regrets about the past, if it's something about the future, stay open to however the mind is. How do we do that? The space is receptive. The mind is like space. The content of the mind is in space. So when the feeling tone of the experience is arising for you, it fills you up, it suffuses you. In the traditional example, it's like a, a crystal ball placed on a red cloth. And when you look at it, it is as if there is some redness in the crystal ball. Then you take the crystal ball and put it on some blue cloth or some green cloth, and it get, takes on some subtle coloration from the cloth. The cloth is not in the crystal ball, the color is not in the crystal ball, but it is as if the color is there. So the purity of the mind is undiminished even in the tiredness. So this is a, the key point from Mahamudra and from Sokshen. In samsara, usually we are living in this dualistic structure, which is about either or. Either I'm fresh or I'm tired. Either I'm male or I'm female. Either I drink tea or I drink coffee. It's either this or that. The Buddhist uh, critique of this is to say everything which arises is inseparable from emptiness and so the seeming polarity between male and female or fresh and tired is delusional because fresh is fresh and empty and tired is tired and empty and there is no profound difference between fresh and tired because they are experiences inseparable from emptiness. So this is the main meaning, meaning of the Heart Sutra. In the place where I'm staying on the edge of the, the, the center, when I go up the stairs, I go into the kitchen and on the wall, they have the Heart Sutra. When I go up the stairs, on the stairs, they have the Heart Sutra. When I go into the bedroom, they have the Heart Sutra. 
This is very, very important. The Heart Sutra is such a beautiful key because it says, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is not other than emptiness, emptiness is not other than form. It's not either or, it's both and, non-contradiction. When you see that everything is non-contradictory to its ground, that is to say, I'm angry, is anger and emptiness. I'm hungry, is hunger and emptiness. It arises in dependent origination. It's there as long as these factors of arising are operating, and then it's gone. It had no inherent existence, no true en enduring validity. It was a temporary structure, like a dream. Everything is like a dream. So, if you compare a dream with a dream, how will you do that? This dream is better than that dream. Fresh is better than tired. It depends on your frame of reference, your set of criteria, the factors that you're using to evaluate the status of the situation. I say I prefer to be fresh. I want to be fresh. I don't want to be tired. But if you're tired, you're tired. It's not a crime to be tired. If you're tired when you're sitting, you get a bit slumpy and heavy. And then after a while, you won't be slumpy and heavy. It's a transient situation. And while you are tired, it's tired and emptiness. It is a terrible sin and it's an insult to the Buddha to fall asleep in meditation. Yes. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. This is very serious. Buddha, bright and shiny. You, dull and stupid. Come on. <laughs> Buddha, help me, help me. Buddha says, how is it to be tired? Hmm. What is that? In the meditation, they say there are two main aspects of uh, two forms of energetic difficulty which arise. One is called gurdpa, which means kind of wild. It means the mind is quick and hot and buzzing here, there and everywhere. And the other is chingwa, which means sinking, like a tired swimmer. It's a hot afternoon, sinking time. Swimming in the sea of Dharma. <laughs> What is it like? This is the key thing. Pay attention to the phenomena. If you go into the criticism, the judgment, the evaluation, you split subject and object. This is happening to me. I am getting tired. Now you're in narrative territory. You're telling a story about your experience. Stay with the experience. What is the, what is the tiredness? Shoulders are heavy. Breathing is changing. There is a dulling. Okay? There are subtle phenomena. Now, because you're tired, it's more difficult to attend to the subtle phenomena, but nonetheless, tiredness is showing tiredness. That's all. And then something else happens. And then something else happens. In each situation, you have phenomena. Phenomena is yes, from the Greek. It means like light and showing. It's a display which arises and is gone rises and it's gone. So don't stand in relation to your experience. Don't stand on the outside commenting. Just see what it's like. If you have already decided this is not good, I shouldn't be like this, I prefer to be something else, now your mental positioning, your idea of how you want to be is in opposition to how it actually is. Then you have an internal conflict. I'm not as good as I should be. It should be different. I've been doing meditation for a long time. How come I still get tired? You can have all kinds of structures like that. You have to recognize this is a pattern of thought. What is a thought? Oh, it's already vanishing. But if the thought catches you, then you go into a critique and a blaming and you struggle to stay awake. Much better to observe the process of relaxing and vanishing. Then you see, oh, going into oblivion, nothing at all. After the break, 
we will look at the nature of oblivion, which is very important. We spend most of our life sleeping one way or another, sometimes with the eyes open, sometimes with the eyes closed, oblivious to ourselves, our true nature for sure, that's 100% of the time, oblivious to many of the factors in the experiential field, that's most of the time. We don't get it because we're not here. We're somewhere else. Can you go somewhere else? You're always here. You're always here. Where would you go? But it is as if you go somewhere else. And this, it is as if, is central. Because you have the truth, the unchanging truth of the mind, which is as is. It is. And then you have as if, which is the world of the imaginal the construction, the interpretation, the appearance. So what we're trying to do is to, not even to awake up, to wake up from the as if, so that we can be fully present in as is, but to see that as if is always in as is. That when you're dreaming, you're here. When I was studying with Chato Rinpoche, uh, he, he said that uh, the relation with the Guru is like two brothers. They're lying in the same bed. One brother is asleep and dreaming and one brother is awake. The Guru is awake and he sees his brother is sleeping. And he tries to help the brother awaken. When the brother awakens, where is he? Where he has always been, in his bed. But when he was dreaming, he didn't know he was in his bed. He was somewhere wandering in the six realms. Where are the six realms? In the dream. Where is the dreamer? In bed. Where is the bed? In the Akanishta Dharma Dhatu, next to Samantha Bhadra. Samantha Bhadra said, hey, stop snoring, wake up. <laughs> 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 we're, we're not anywhere else except in the openness of the mind. This is a dream time of these fixations. So when you get persecuted by a thought, I can't meditate, this is hopeless, I feel so dull, observe you're going into judgment. Stay present with the movement of the judgment and there you see the creativity which generates samsara. I am creating a negative identity for myself. I'm doing this. I'm construing it. I'm taking the elements of my experience and I'm formulating them in a way that gives them density and truth. And now I'm in prison. I'm in the prison of my belief that my thought tells me the truth. Stay with that thought that is telling you the profound truth about yourself and within three seconds it's gone. <laughs> that is amazing. Everything that you think about yourself is vanishing. And yet you believe that you've been told the truth. So this is like some terrible fascist state where there's a called to the secret police. We found Mary. We know where she lives. You should arrest her. Who made the phone call? Gone. Mary gets arrested. What's the evidence? Gone. You've imprisoned yourself. What's the evidence? Well, some thoughts. I had thoughts. I know I can't meditate. I'm a, no, I'm a bad person. I'm not good. I shouldn't be doing this. Gone. But in prison imprisoned by a vanished informer. <laughs> we want justice. We want to turn on the light of clarity. We don't want to be locked up in the dungeon. And it's not much fun. So that's what happens. You observe that for yourself. Nobody imprisons you but yourself. But you can't argue with it. You have to catch it in the moment when you see 
the merging in the thought, the identification with the thought as if it was the truth of my identity is a dream. I have no definite identity. I don't exist in a fixed state. I have multiple identities. And therefore, if I'm dull and stupid, part of my repertoire. <laughs> I've been in drama for a long time. I've done kings, queens, murderers, doctors. I do anything. I'm an actor. I'm stupid. I can't meditate. Yeah, well, it's so proper, you know. You have to get jobs wherever you can. <laughs> Difficult to be an actor. So you, this is what I am now. This is what I am now. Yes and no. Yes, it's true. Full of it. Can't help it. Falling asleep. Is it me? Yes and no. It is illusion, drama. It's the mandala of all the Buddhas. The angry Buddhas are not angry. And the nice Buddhas, maybe not so nice all the time. It depends. Every Buddha said everything depends on circumstances. <laughs> because you have 21 forms of Tara, and they're not all sweet. Uh -huh. How come? I thought she was really nice. Mother Tara. Yeah? What about your own mom? Was she almost nice? <laughs> maybe not. Okay, let's have a break. Okay, so let's see if there are any questions from what we've done so far. It's always good to not stay with confusion. I talked um, about the ground. And my question is whether I have my ground and you have yours, or we all have a ground together, or there are many grounds. Or, I mean, it, I, I didn't quite see so far. So okay. So, in the. In the in Sanskrit, they say alaya, which means like a, <clears throat> a base or a foundation. And in Tibetan, they say ji, which means like the ground or the earth, what's beneath our feet. It's, it's something uh, you can stand on, which is, uh, let's just say, where you are. And it's also the source. So we are emerging from the source without leaving the source. And this source cannot be found as something. So it's not my ground, because it's ungraspable, unowned, <clears throat> non-relative. The ground doesn't stand in relation to anything else. So one couldn't say, you have your ground and I have mine because that would be to divide and put this in relation to that. The ground is uh, described uh, in different texts in different ways. There are many, many uh, descriptions, but uh, this very useful one comes from this uh, prayer of Samantabhadra, which some of us have looked at before. It says that the ground has these five qualities. It is firstly uncompounded, that is to say, it's not a construct, it hasn't been created by the bringing together of any other elements. This leads to the second quality is that it is um, self-occurring or self-arising, it's to say Rang Jung, it, nobody is pushing it out, it's, it has no source other than itself, we might then say it is intrinsic, it just is. It has, there was no time before it, time is within it, location is within it. <clears throat> uh, 
The third quality is Kloyang, uh, which means it is um, vast. It has no end. It has no top, no bottom. It can't be uh, measured in any way. You can't get to the bottom of it. Fourthly, um, it is indescribable, it's unrepresentable. That is to say, it is never an object for a concept. So we can say car park outside or lamp or tree. The concept has a referent. It is pointing towards something in the direction of something. But whatever we say about the ground is not pointing at anything. This is what makes it beyond expression. Language is grounded in duality. It's a, language is the method by which we organize our experience inside duality. We talk about things. We give descriptions of things. Some of the things we describe are objects for our senses. Some of the things are, and so in that sense, they are public. I might say, um, one of the things I like about this place is it's a little bit uh, run down. It's a little bit broken. It's not too tidy. It's slightly un-German. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> then you can look and you see, yes, there are weeds growing here and there and the pathway is a little bit broken and that has a quality to it. We both can see it or we could touch it, you could lick it if you wanted or sniff the path, you'd get some sensory impression. Oh yeah, this is not brand new. Some of the things we describe in language are more private. I might say last night I had a dream and described the dream and you might think, well, you know, I've had dreams like that or that makes sense. Some of the things could be something you have no connection with at all. Like you, you might read an account of someone torturing a child to death. How is that possible? How is that possible? Your mind is not able to imagine its way into the, the state from which somebody tortures a child to death and then cuts them up, cuts off their fingers. These things happen. A lot of bad things happen to children. But we go speechless with these things. Our mind goes a bit blank. We can't access them. But that's different from the difficulty of the, or the impossibility of expressing anything about the ground. So it's exactly like in the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra lists all the general, generally accepted items which are seen as compositional factors of experience in Buddhism. And it says each and every one of these is empty. That is to say, it is a name describing a form of nothing. There is no existent which is being described. So it says all the 12 stages of dependent origination that you see on the wheel of life, each of these, there is no real referent. It's just an idea. And it says there is no wisdom. There is no enlightenment. It's just a concept. It doesn't mean that there is no enlightenment. What it means is if you take the concept of enlightenment and you build something up on top of it and you think you know what you're talking about, then you're making problems for yourself. Because the issue is how do you stay fresh, relaxed and open <coughs> with concepts without relying on concepts? So then the fifth quality of the ground is that it cannot be located within the names samsara and nirvana, which in general Buddhism sums everything up. It's either 
imprisonment, limitation, confusion in samsara, or liberation into nirvana. He says, it cannot be caught by any concept like that. So the ground is completely open, completely beyond the structures of interpretation by which we make sense of things, and it is our own very source. That is to say, the sky is open, and when you look in the sky, you see birds, insects, aeroplanes, rainbows, clouds of many different forms. It is the openness of the sky which allows it to offer hospitality to all of these forms. Before there were things, substantial things like aeroplanes traveling in the sky, there was more the sense that the cloud emerges from the sky, just as a rainbow seems to emerge from the sky and goes back into it. That the sky itself is not other than the cloud. So going back to what we looked at just before the break, the issue of either or or both and. Uh, the thing we learn in school about uh, volumes of bodies displacing equal volumes of other uh, <coughs> material things. For example, the famous story of Archimedes gets in the bath in the water splashes over the side. And he gets, oh, I have displaced the water from the bath. And then he goes on to measure it and he sees, oh, the same volume of water came out of the bath when the volume of my body went into it. So in the bath, there's either all water or a bit of water and me, but there can't be all water and me because the water goes out. I displace water, which is generally how we think of things as either or. Now, with the mirror, when you look in the mirror, the reflection is there. Does the reflection displace anything to get into the mirror? If you have a plain piece of paper and you draw even just a simple circle on it, the circle has, if you like, displaced the simple integrity of the plain piece of paper because you now look and you see white paper and whatever color of pen you use, a circle. There is paper, there's unmarked paper, and there is marked paper, and they're not the same. So you have either or. As soon as you make a mark, the mark alters the situation, which is the same if you're a painter and you're building something up. As soon as you start to make marks, when you're painting, you're now painting in relation to the mark that has been made. So you put some pale green down and then you put down a red and the red and the green go into a conversation and it looks a bit intense so you might put down some yellow to modify the contradiction or you might want to intensify it. So you're now into complex dialoguing between the impact of shape and color. That's not like a mirror, because the reflection's in the mirror, and then the person moves away, and the reflection's gone. Do you take your reflection with you? No. Did you put your reflection into the mirror? No. Do you have a reflection? Do you have a shadow? When you walk down the street on full moon night, and you look around, oh, What's that? My shadow. Is it mine? Can you pick your shadow up and do something with it? Oh, like a dream, like an echo, like the reflection of the full moon in water. So, the arising of appearance from the ground, in the ground, with the ground, is like the reflection in the mirror. It's not like a painting. 
the painting leaves an indelible mark. Once the paint uh, stroke is made, the paper or the canvas is now marked and you're stuck with that mark. You can do something with it. You can modify it, uh, try to erase it, rub it down, put oil on it to thin it and so on. But you can't take it out. So in uh, the Dzogchen tradition, they say that the, the, the emergence of awareness from the ground reveals these two aspects. The primordial purity, which is the fact that the ground is never marked. It never ever marked. No matter what happens, the ground is not marked. We get marked. Why? Because we are marks. We are compounded. We are like paintings. When you've got memories, say, of your childhood, if your parents were a bit difficult or whatever, you didn't feel loved or you fought with your siblings or whatever the structure was, these situations impact you and you take on a particular kind of responsive shape with regard to them. And if you don't get free of them, you go through life with that particular tilt or intensity or weariness you are marked so nowadays we talk a lot about trauma which is another way of saying that trauma means a wound or an injury you have to have a thing to be wounded if i don't like this glass i can throw it at the floor and break it if i don't like the air I won. <laughs> you can't attack the air, it gets out the way. It's quicker than Muhammad Ali. <laughs> so it's like that. There's marking and there's not marking. And not marking is very different from being marked. Now, what is the nature of our marking? It tends to be that we have conceptualized a difficulty. Because in the, certainly in my lifetime, through the second half of the last century and into this, been many, many wars, many, many accounts of people who've lived through great difficulties. There have been the Holocaust survivors from the camps uh, and so on. Some of these people were deeply, deeply damaged, and some people not so damaged. In uh, my psychotherapy practices in North London, where many Jewish people, I've had many, many Jewish patients, and in their family, their stories about what happened. And some of the families are completely distorted by the pressure of these events. And for some, they just say, oh, granddad never talked about it. We never knew where he had been. He didn't like to talk about it. He liked gardening. He sang in the choir. He did his job. He was good. We played, had a lot of fun on holiday. Mm -hmm. He was like just dad or granddad. So the war had faded away from him. And for other people, it stayed with them. Now, what is that? It cannot just be the quality of the object impacting the subject. There must be some kind of vibration or interaction or formulation of identity that comes from it. My father fought in the Second World War in uh, Burma against the Japanese, was very unpleasant in these jungles with a lot of killing and he was blown up and he had metal plate in his skull and in his legs and so on. And he, he just said that. That was then. That was then. That was then. The only time he made a point was when I was maybe 13. I sent away on the back of a magazine transistor radio for about two pounds or something. And it arrived and I was showing my dad. And he looked at it and said, made in Japan, not in this house. <laughs> so there was some little wound there. <laughs> but generally, it didn't seem to get to him. 
So it's very interesting to see. Some people are completely crushed by events. Some people hardly touched. That hardly touchedness could be a kind of disassociation. It could be a repression of horror. Or it could be, it happens. It happens. Life goes on. So what's, there's intense marking and there's subtle marking. But if we are a sentient being, we are going to be marked. That's the fact. Because to be a sentient being, as we looked earlier, we have these two domains, the domain of awareness and the domain of consciousness. And we are creatures of consciousness. We are conscious through our senses of our memories, of our life story, of our plans. I think about what I will do. <coughs> that creates a particular formation. I, Martin was just telling me that then a message had come saying that my return flight from Frankfurt, they <laughs> want to change the time of it. So maybe success and maybe not. Let's see tomorrow. In fact, we could start gambling. Will it be changed by hours or days or maybe months? <laughs> it's an uncertain world. We don't know. This is multiple factors are operating. We're not in charge. And that's part of the vulnerability of being a human being because it's quite good to get to the airport and knowing that you'll get on a plane. It's quite good to know that your bag will arrive when you arrive. There are many things, the conjunction of which is very helpful in life. Otherwise, it's, it's like a tear, which is really like a kind of trauma. It's a lesion in the smoothness of the predictability of my world. And I think that's the state for eagles. They like that. Children like to have their comfort toy. They like to know where they sleep. They like their eggs cooked the way they like them. These things are stabilizing for the person, a degree of predictability. And in an unstable world, we're likely to be destabilized. But the ground is not resting on anything. And we are not resting on the ground. We are the showing of the ground. We are like the reflection in the mirror. Our mind has these three aspects. It is, they say, mowo rangshin tukchi. Mowo means <coughs> the intrinsic or how the mind is. It also can point to the face. So you have your basic face. The face, in a sense, is an open potential. It's not yet performative, not demonstrative. The second is rangshin, which is the clarity of the mind, which is the arising of the field of immediacy. Just this, all at once, just this, undivided. That's like the complexion of the face. When you see someone's face and you see the complexion, you get a sense whether they're healthy or tired. Before they're showing any personal expression, there's just, as it were, the body showing itself as the, as the complexion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then within that, the third aspect is called Tujikunkya, all-pervading compassion, which is the expressiveness of your face in which you show emotions and connectivity and the eye contact. And somebody's telling you a sad story and you have eye contact with them. Your face is changing. They say, yeah, there's been a terrible accident. Oh, you know, oh, your voice changes. Your whole posture and gesture changes. So this is the compassion, the co-emergent arising of this particular formation with other formations. I'm not a fixed thing. I will respond, but I will respond according to the event. So I'm both receptive and responsive. That's the third element, and that's how our facial expression shows itself. So these three come together. They are inseparable. Open, empty ground, infinite bright clarity, which is showing the potential, because that's what the complexion shows. If somebody looks sick, you probably wouldn't say, hey, let's run up the hill. 
<laughs> you know, the, the complexion is showing available or not available on a very basic level. And then within that, there is the responsiveness that arises. So the quality of the ground is like that. When you awaken to the ground, that your own ground is open and empty, that reveals to you that everything that is occurring is the radiance, <coughs> excuse me, or the showing or the revelation of the potential of the ground. And then you find yourself forming and reforming within connectivity in that field. So that's, uh, that's got the sense of the ground that it is nothing at all and yet not nothing at all. Whatever we say about it will need some kind of correction. You can't sum it up in a one-liner. You can't define it, but what we can do is we can start to inhabit it. When we look for the mind, we don't find anything. When we sit with the arising and vanishing of our thoughts, we see that these patternings of our lived experience are transient, temporary, and already gone. So, oh, this is like the illuminative clarity of the mind. Clarity doesn't mean I am clear about that. It's not a rational formation. It is the showing of the bright ungraspability of events. That is to say, you experience, you receive, and then you formulate. You don't receive the formulation. Oh, I could hear a car going by. Did I hear a car? I heard the sound, I formulated, a car is going by. I didn't hear a car. That's the difference. I cooked the car. I received the sound and I cooked it, salt, pepper, car. <laughs> the car is not self-existing. There are no self-existing objects. This is the co-emergence of subject and object in the ceaseless pulsation of formation. Yeah? So if we get that, then if we're here, bright and fresh, you get the immediacy and the preparation. Because you have to cook yourself to serve yourself to other people. Yeah? You have a personal potential. You see how someone else is and you formulate yourself, not as a conscious activity, but simply through the openness of your receptivity, you respond. And you do that if you have free availability. Yes. Oh, you need the do that. Yeah. I hope it's there. Um, you, said, you said now, uh, you have uh, some potential you formulated, and within this potential, the play of the ground is arising. But nowadays, it's for me that uh, the world is really overwhelming or overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sometimes I don't know if quite a lot of things are coming, then it's really hard for me to relax in the openness <laughs> because uh, I don't get to think what enlightened us yet <laughs> or okay. what the not goodness mm -hmm. but uh, so quite a lot is stuck in and how you would say now uh, if you speak like a medi uh, like a yogi how you mm -hmm. would answer this not like a therapist Okay. <laughs> well, I give you an example from my life. When I was um, still in primary school, maybe 11 years of age, at the back of the school there was a wall, and next to the wall there was a lamppost. 
and the wall was quite high and I decided to jump from the wall onto the lamppost. And I can remember in my body floating through the air and missing the lamppost and hitting the ground. So I was very hurt and covered in blood. And I managed to get home and I crawled up the steps of the house and I couldn't get up to ring the bell and it was banging on the door and the door opened and my father was there and he said, I told you not to. <laughs> and then my mother ran past him, pushed him aside and took me into the kitchen and started to clean me. But I think it's exactly like that. You know, my father wanted the best for me. He had an idea. He had told me all kinds of things. He wanted to keep me safe and he couldn't. So the, the reaction is an unhelpful arousal. And that's what we're likely to see with many of the things that come. Once it's happened, it's happened. And the thought, it shouldn't have happened, and we could have done that, and why didn't we do that? And all this eruption of ideas is simply like punching yourself in the face. In a sense, we have to do a bit like my mom and think, okay, what do we do now? What do we do now? And so if you go up in your helicopter with the overview of abstract thoughts and planning and, you know, we knew about this 20 years ago and we didn't do anything. And now look at the situation. It doesn't change anything. And the fact is, if we want to help people, we have to be close to them. And it may, nothing may, good may come of it, but it's by the small, by the nuance, by the actual contact that some shift can occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, you spoke in the, in the morning uh, today about uh, this neutral position when we are to make shamatha. And uh, I think it's, uh, for me, it's uh, uh, similar to the, when I'm around with the people, I can be uh, very neutral and very attentive and uh, very responsive and uh, just run by. You know, it's just coming out. I don't mind in anything, but I'm, uh, I'm with the people and, and it's nice. But uh, with some other, uh, it's very, very difficult especially for you, with you. So when I'm with you, I see, I don't know what to say. <laughs> My mind is full of, of words, of sentences, of, head, of, of ideas and, and questions, and <laughs> I can't get out a word. <laughs> and when I'm with, uh, with the people here, I can chit-chatting, I can <laughs> just hear about and, and whatever. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a sign of my good karma. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's very it's very important, isn't it? Because there are different kinds of availability. And uh, if we can set a kind of uh, tune or tone, that can help to manage a situation without saying anything. This is a skill that school teachers need to develop, that they come into the classroom and the students, without being told no, better not cause trouble. <laughs> a good teacher can manage that not so skilled teachers or in a very disruptive school, it becomes impossible. And then you are firefighting. Each issue that arises, you have to respond. And the more you respond, the more you get woven into it. And then you expose yourself and then people are put pointing into your back and what you've shown. That's hard. But uh, we are situationally emergent. We are co-emergent. We can't just look inside to ourselves and then speak, because if we do that, we may well lose the other person. 
So if we speak with others, the withness is the basis of our speaking. We're not just speaking to someone, but we're speaking with the felt sense of how they are. And that opens doors or closes them. So I would say that's quite healthy. What is possible in this situation? Namtai Norval often talked about working with circumstances. So circumstances is how you find yourself being. And we know that we have different relations with different people. We are here and we will relate to each of the people here in different ways. We will be formulated or we will come into formation through our contact with the people who are here. And that will depend on whether we are preoccupied, whether we've had easy experiences with them in the past, whether we slept well. There's many factors operating in that. But unless we are on kind of best behavior and trying our best and being nice, if we're actually simply participating, we'll find it easy or not easy. What does it mean? It means this is the felt sense of the field of experience as it is at the moment. It's not a proof, I don't like that person. It's that I have nothing to say. I find myself silenced. It's like that at this moment for some time and then maybe something different. Because everything is resonance, everything is vibrational. How, could it, how would it be if we had equal uh, access to every aspect of other people? It's not like that. We, some aspects of ourselves, you know, we can think of it in terms of the chakras. You can like someone and love them, but you might not want to sleep with them. You might want to sleep with someone, but you don't really like them or love them. They could have very complex interactions with people. That's because we, we can be in one particular center or one particular nexus of energy that has a vibration and that's all it is. So you have a transaction on that level. Some people spend a lot of their life just going for physical sex. They want someone, they get together, they do various bodily things and that's that. And they're quite happy. For other people that will be impossible. They say, oh, if I don't love someone, why would I sleep with them? What would be the point of that? because their doorway is a different chakra entrance. So we can see there are many, many varieties in that way. So I think that how we open and close to, to people in different situations is something very interesting to observe. It could be a lifetime pattern. It could be an event pattern. Some people send me long emails with lots of details. And when I see them, they don't say very much to me. You know, there's all kinds of... Uh, patterns that arise. Any other questions or things you want to raise? Yeah. We've got uh, two microphones. Maybe we uh, keep one in the front and another one in the back. So mm -hmm. people don't have to walk so long. <laughs> 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 speech, speech. <laughs> Nothing to say. When we heard that sound passing by here, uh, you made a very funny point to say this is actually sound, but we cook it up to be a car. Yeah. But I think if you are in this world, uh, this cooking up as a car is a more adequate cooking than if you say that was a monster farting and going by. Yeah. So it seems there is more to it than just the binary thing between mm -hmm. not cooking and cooking. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that? Okay. Please? Interesting. <laughs> the, 
the simple conjunction between the sound and the interpretation it's a car uh, could be more complex. It could be, I recognize that kind of car. I've always wanted to have a car like that. It sounds like a very powerful engine. It could be all kinds of elaborations like that. It could be a fantasy on top of it. You might be playing with a child and you think, oh, was that a dragon farting? And then you go off in some story together. So it could go in any direction. I guess the question would be, what would such elaborations be in the service of? It could be playful connectivity in an improvisational group where you brainstorm suddenly about it. But the, the simple correlation of identifying or, let's say it, accurately identifying the object is, of course, vital in life. If you were in an Indian village, knowing the difference between very dangerous snakes and ordinary snakes is very important. And if a snake bites you and slithers away, it's very important to know what it is so that you can get to the, the local health center and get some help before you die. So that is inside relative truth. It is based on conventions. First convention is I'm here and I hear something there, something is occurring and I have my sense of it. So that's already an interpretive construct and we're always interpreting. Um, what, we, what we bring to it um, will depend on circumstances. You know, clearly in Ukraine at the moment, People are learning to hear the sound of shells and rockets, just as uh, in the in the war, the Second World War, people would hear the rockets, the V2 rockets being sent over from Germany, and they would. The terrible thing was they would make a noise, and then the the engine would cut off, and they'd go silent, and there would be like ten seconds, and then they would bang, and people wouldn't be able to work out where they were or what they were doing, and that was reported as the very upsetting thing. Because our in duality, as we've touched on before, we're, we're caught up in prediction because we want to make sense of the world. If you just relax your mind and open to the perceptual field, for example, if you go outside and the sunshine is coming through the leaves in the trees and it's moving around, if you just really relax, it's like, so much is going on, it could be chaotic or it could just be very rich and multi-textured or multicolored. If you're very relaxed, it's fine. However it is, it's fine. Or you could just look at the shadows on the, on the, on the roof here, the dappling of the light. What is it? It's just that. But you might want to know what it is. So I think it's how we are predisposed. If you have had a lot of uncertainty in your life or in your previous life, and you come into this world anxious and wanting to know what's happening, <clears throat> then the urge to nail things down would be uh, probably very powerful for you. We see that in families. If there's two or three children, they probably don't have the same take on situations. Some sleep very easily. They feed, they take to the breast very easily. They wean very easily. They get into language very easily. And they're kind of playful and expansive. Some stranger comes to the house and they can start to make eye contact. And other children are kind of very wary. They don't sleep well. They cry a lot. They, they get anxious around animals, same mother, same father, same kind of food, same kind of environment, and yet it ripens in that way. So I think it's, uh, it's, a t it's very much a two-way thing. It's like the, the range of impact, whether they're predicted or uncertain, and our inherited or karmic disposition and whether there's a lot of reassurance or not reassurance in the family matrix probably predisposes us in different ways. But that is a psychological answer. You wanted the Dharma answer. Uh, I don't know that there is a Dharma answer except to say karma.
which doesn't explain anything. Due to something you can't remember, you find yourself being like this, which you can't explain. <laughs> Okay, anything else? So maybe you start to open up a little bit uh, looking at the nature of unawareness. Uh, because it, it's helpful, I think, to approach it from different points of view and to see how it operates. So the ground that we just touched on is indeterminate. It is beyond determination according to any interpretive schema. Whatever criteria you have, mathematical, research physics, German history, none of these ways of, of linking facts to make patterns can be applied to the ground. But as the texts say, in the manner of a magical occurrence, something just happens. There is no reason why it happens, because anything could happen. The ground is the ground of all. So there is no limit to what can arise from the ground. Why? Why is it like this? Who knows? When I would ask uh, Siya Lama this question, he would say, when you get enlightened and you see the Buddha, you ask him this question. <laughs> I am not the sort of person you should ask these questions to. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> these are unanswerable questions. We don't have access to the information. They are the basis of metaphysical speculation, and there are many, many metaphysical theories, many, many ways in which you can imagine and imagine and imagine. But if you want to know as is, it's not imagined, so don't imagine, don't speak about it. <clears throat> That's it. exactly what the Buddha felt when he awakened under the Bodhi tree. He said, I'm not going to say a word, because people will speculate about what I say, and they'll ask me all these kind of questions. And so we have that story that um, when the Buddha was teaching, at one point he picked up a flower and he gave it to Mahakasyapa, one of his very close disciples. And he just held up the flower and looked at it and smiled. And the Buddha was very happy. No need to say anything. <laughs> because he got it, and he got what couldn't be said. When we get into talking about, then we, we enter into the realms of maybe this, maybe that, good, bad, correction, and all the rest of it. So going back to the issue of ignorance and how it arises, something occurs, some pulse of luminosity or clarity, oh, oh, not a full subject, just a something happenness, an event <clears throat> that vanishes, oblivion, no memory, no recollection, unconscious, nothing at all, then something Oh, oh, then unconscious. What is arising is the energy of the ground. The energy of the ground is not seen. As these moments of occurrence arise, which are very very shapeless, like kind of dream images or being out on a dark night and there's an electrical storm and the lights flashing in the clouds, it's like it's already gone, a bit bewildering. As the repetition value of that continues, you start to have the beginning of formation. So that first stage is called the 
unawareness or the not being present with how it is as in, in terms of the arising of somethingness. This somethingness is not yet specific, but it's something is happening. What is it? So somethingness brings what is it? Now, what is it is already both a retraction and an advance. What, what's that? Oh, you go back and then you go forward. You don't know, you do know. So you have a pulsation like a kind of strobe light in which you start to get an impactful sense of what's occurring. That formulates in terms of something's happening for me, something's happening to me. Object, subject, this pulsation starts to strengthen both, a bit like if you were going to play table tennis with someone. And you, at first you start in quite a friendly way and then they kind of quicken the pace. <laughs> So the movement of the ball is making both of you kind of right in there with the, the ball is the master. So the connectivity, the connection is now increasing the vibration and reverberation. And that starts to formulate as a kind of separate nexus of subject and object. That's called co-emergent unawareness because Subject and object are emerging together, but they are emerging also in relation to the ground. So it's as if you had a very big mirror and you put something very beautiful down in front of it and something very ugly in front of it. The beautiful and the ugly would arise together. And you look at them and say, oh, I don't like that one, but that's okay. They're both reflections. They're just reflections. There's nothing there. But you have a reaction, a differential reaction and a differentiating reaction to these images. Does that make sense? So now you're starting to get variety coming out. And this is variety is linked to somethingness. This is attractive to me and I like it. This is not attractive to me and I don't like it. So the more I see different qualities in the object field, the more I feel a range of emotions and sensations in response. And of course, that's a two-way street because I'm feeling this beginning of this sensation. When I look at you, that means I want to see you again. I like you. So the sensation is leading either to desire for more contact or aversion, I don't want to have this contact. So there's now a kind of prefiguring or a predetermination of the structuring of the nascent self, the beginning self, which is leading into selective attention in the field of possibilities. And the more you have selective attention, the selection is based on your prejudice, the judgment you have made before. So you might go out in the evening and you get your food and you come out and you think, oh, I'll go and sit in the sun. And then you see someone sitting there and you think, oh, maybe I won't sit there. I'll go and sit over on that table. I won't be in such a beautiful place, but I won't be beside that person because I don't like that person. So now your perception has been captured by an idea that you have access to a definitive uh, understanding of the qualities of the other. And that, of course, entrains us in all kind of decisions in life. Some children decide very early on, I don't like maths, I'm not going to do maths. What you get in Britain anyway is a lot of boys in particular deciding, I don't like reading, I'm not going to read. And they decide from a very early age, and you can try whatever you like, but you won't make them read. And other kids, they want to go to the library two or three times a week and get out books, and they're so excited. So 
That's the, the nature of prefiguring or tendencies, and that, of course, is supported by karma. So that's the second level. In the third level is where you have a, a naming that goes on to these pattern formations, and the name somehow secures it and settles it so that with the name, the conjunction of the name and the phenomena, you know what you're seeing and the mind then settles. Oh, you're one of them. Oh, I know what your kind of person is like, which we see in prejudice all over the world. And the advantage of prejudice is that it's very quick. <laughs> if you have prejudice, you don't have to think. In fact, you know before you see. The senses can go on holiday because these fucking people, you know what they're like, you know. The people in that valley, do you know what they're like? Let me tell you. Oh, let's kill them. We'll go over tonight, make these bombs, we'll get the knives out, cut their fucking throats, fucking bastards. That will be happening tonight in Ethiopia. Tonight there will be murder and rape. And it's all on the basis of exactly that kind of construction. We know what they're like. It's terrifying. You do, you've never met the people, but you know them before you see them. Therefore, when you see them, you see what you know, you don't actually see. And phenomena are then completely obscured inside the conceptual wrapper. And that's the basis for so much killing and cruelty in the world. And then on the basis of that third level of ignorance, you have the ignorance of not understanding karma, which means if we get rid of all these people, we're doing the world a favor. You know what they're like. I know what they're like. Let's kill them. They're bad. So on that basis, believing that I know the truth about them, I murder. And I think we did well. We did well. Get these scum out of here. Think. But without any thought, there will be a retribution. Maybe the police will never come. Maybe I'll never go to a war crimes trial. But in yourself, the karmic formation of deciding to not respond to the living vitality, the Buddha nature, the potential of the other, to decide to annihilate them, not only is that a horrific crime towards them, but imagine what you do to yourself. How dull, how blind, how intoxicated you have to do, you have to be to carry that out. So that's the energy that leads to the karmic patterning which unfolds. So that's a general Nyingmapa account of how unawareness or ignoring manifests in the world. And for us, as meditators, the first stage is very important because it's subtle and yet we're not strangers to it. Because at night time, you lie down and you go nowhere. You go into oblivion. No memory, no recollection, gone. That is exactly the quality of the first level of ignorance. The problem, of course, is because you have no recollection, you can't do anything with it. It's just like a big hole in your life. Maybe quite nice that you can sleep, you feel a bit refreshed in the morning, but it's a kind of dead time in terms of awareness. And it arises as an either or. So in the practice, what we are aiming to do is to bring a sense of awareness into the experiences of oblivion. So, for example, in the literature about the bardo, about the processes of the various stages of life and the process of death, when consciousness starts to disconnect from its embeddedness in the body, that is to say, when the sense, <coughs> excuse me, 
the sense consciousnesses start to not be able to mobilize the body. Your, your body can't move anymore and your eyes are open, but you don't really see. They say the last of the sense consciousnesses to go is hearing, which is why in the tradition they say you can recite prayers for people who are dying and who seem to have died because there's still some connection, but they're not seeing anymore. So gradually the sense consciousnesses, all of them, gather in the heart, merge with the mental consciousness, the uh, consciousness of the five poisons and the ground consciousness, and they dissolve together into the most basic formation, which is oblivion. So when you read in the, this is the, you go from the, the bardo of dying into the chunyi bardo, the bardo of the actual, which is infinite space. This is the ground itself. <clears throat> this is the unborn openness, which is beyond concept. And it's there, but because we have spent our life moving towards experience mediated through our conceptual interpretation, there's nothing to hang on to. You can't, you can't move it in any way. You can't, and you just go out because we are used to subject and object. If I could think about it, if I could identify something, then I would know what to do. It's just yeah, unconscious. Then from that, you start to experience the arising of the peaceful gods and then the wrathful gods and then into the next life. So oblivion is very, very important. How can you be aware of nothing? So this goes back to what we touched on this morning. Consciousness takes an object. Awareness doesn't need an object. This is the absolute marker. It is because awareness doesn't need an object that you can be aware in nothing. You can't be conscious in nothing because you have to be conscious of something. So that's why when we sit, we try to not be distracted because what we've been doing is focusing our attention on something very simple, something which offers very few hooks it's not exciting to keep your attention on the breath. And so in that moment, we are vulnerable to being caught by other things, by carried this way and that. And if we can settle onto the breath, the power of the exciting object gets less for us. So that is to say, I can be present in boredom. Mm -hmm. If parents are lucky, their children will learn to be present in boredom and that will make long car journeys much easier. <laughs> because when children are bored and they want something to happen, it's very, very difficult. Nowadays you can put on a little computer screen and they can watch a movie. But in the old days it was quite difficult. How to be present with nothing? because nothing is the empty stage, the open stage within which everything is moving. It is an unmarked space, just as we would say a blank piece of paper is open to any kind of mark you want to make. You could use watercolor, oils, collage. You could pick your nose and rub it onto the surface. You could cut your veins and rub the blood in. Any kind of modern artist do all sorts of things. Smear it with your shit if you want. If you've got a good agent, make some money. You can make any mark you want, but you have to make it on something. So black paper is open to any kind of mark and oblivion is open to everything. It is the true open, empty mind. And then the dawn arises, which is awareness, which illuminates the patternings of potential. And then we find ourselves moving inside that. So the difference is that awareness has a broad spectrum of potential. You can be aware of everything. 
but you can only be conscious of certain things because consciousness is controlled by the ego. It is very common for women to find that they don't enjoy shopping for clothes with men. Men tend to become impatient. They tend to say, but you looked at that before. Well, why don't you buy that one? That looks good. Are you sure? What do you like about it? Oh, it's fine. Good. Yeah. No, no, you buy it. Please go. Let's go. <laughs> and you, you can see what that's like. That how do you tune into a vibration that you don't feel? You don't have access to that person's relation to clothing and identity and the performativity of being feminine in our kind of culture. That this is about me expressing myself. In the blocks thinking, just I'll buy three shirts from my home. <laughs> what, what the hell? It's just clothes. Come on. <laughs> so that's a selective attention. You know, it's, it, it's, it's coming into formation for you. You cannot see. You just cannot see what's attractive to someone else in doing that. Why would you want to do that? Oh, I've been to the hairdresser. What do you think? <laughs> good? Yeah, it's good. What do you like about it? <laughs> oh, that's good. That's really, really good. Did it cost a lot? How much did you pay for that? <laughs> that's selective attention. That's where you see the karma of being male or female, whatever your sexual orientation is, whatever pathways open up for you, you find yourself resonating or not resonating. So, that's prefiguring. That's us in consciousness, available for certain kinds of object formation and neutral or having no reaction to some other formations and having antipathy and negative rejecting feeling towards others. Awareness is not like that. Awareness is just aware. Just see. Okay, it's like that. Non-judgmental. Again, as Namkai Norbu used to say so many times, don't enter into judgment. Because judgment means this is not good or this is good, which is a coded way of saying, I don't like it. If you say, I don't like it, at least your subjectivity is involved. If you say, this is no good, you've taken a feeling tone and turned it into a concrete definition of something out there. I mean, that's why uh, judgment is bad, because it has two aspects. One, it's investing the object with an emotion that actually belongs to you. And secondly, it's solidifying it, it's reifying it, saying there is something there and it's not good. From Dharma point of view, both propositions are false. There isn't something there. This is a, a scene, a scenario, which is open to unfolding according to your participation. Your, partation, your participation allows the revelation of certain aspects. Mm -hmm. It's like that. How you participate, how you open, this is what you receive. So judgment blocks that. I know what it is. I know what I like. I like what I know. I know what I like. I like what I know. I'm reliable. I'm predictable. I'm a good person. You won't get any funny business with me. I know what I like. I like what I know. I like what I know. I know what I like. <laughs> and it's not true. Because people's patterning changes. It changes. So that, that's why our task is always to relax out of dualistic consciousness into non-dual awareness. Both are patternings of experience. One arises from unawareness, that's dualistic consciousness. One arises from awareness, that is to say, awareness of the ground reveals this inseparability of openness 
and clarity and precise manifestation. Mm -hmm. So this is always our choice. And we're going to die. And we don't know how long we'll live. And we don't know whether we'll be healthy in the remaining years of our life. We could be paralyzed. We could get a stroke. We could be in a wheelchair. We could be unable to speak or wipe our own arse. It happens. And it happens to people like us. So we have a window of opportunity. So this is our chance to really be close to ourselves, to be aware of how we shape ourselves through our selective involvement with thoughts, feelings, and sensations, and just relax it a little bit, ease it up, and allow these patterns to remain as potentials, but not necessarily activated. You have a shelf. On the shelf, there is a bottle of whiskey. <clears throat> that bottle of whiskey has been there for five years. You look at it, and you walk on. Not in my house you don't. <laughs> in some people's houses, they do that. Because the bottle of whiskey doesn't sing. When I bring a bottle of whiskey into my house, the first thing it gets is the blessing of the sirens. They sit on the rocks and they call, Jimmy, hey, Jimmy, we love you, come here, have a wee one with us. The power is not in the object. But I'm innocent. I don't know why I do it. You can experience that in your own life, how you've pulled into things and you don't even know why. why. Why does this appeal to me? Don't focus on the object. Stay with the arising of the feeling. If you see the emergence of the attitude from the open, empty mind, the poison is taken out of it. But if you collapse into it, it will lead you a merry dance. Okay, shall we take a break now for the day? We have a nice evening.